My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Counter them, they will not mean so much to you anymore. Imagine for a second that you came into this world at the age of 25. And then you just stood in the world and you looked to the heavens and you saw the clouds. You saw the blue sky and you saw the cloud moving. If you are not careful, you will faint and die. But you see, because you grew up as a child and you began to interact with some of these very strange realities, it became normal to you. So even as an adult, you don't settle down to contemplate the power that holds the foundations of the earth. You don't sit down to contemplate the power that causes the cloud to hover in the heavens, hanging on nothing. Everything that is supposed to be supernatural to you becomes normal because you came up as a child and you were not taught the mysteries that make these things to work. Job was like that, walking with the Lord. It didn't occur to him that the clouds in the heavens, the waters in the, in the river, that kept their boundaries, it didn't occur to him that it was an invisible hand that made things work the way they worked. He never knew that the superlative intelligence that divine designed the patterns in creation was put in place by an invisible force until the plague of his life came to him. And in the midst of crisis and adversity, Job lifted up his voice and began to lament against God. And for the first time, God appeared to him and made him understand that even the creation around him was supposed to inform him of the supernatural dimensions of God. It became normal for Job that the waters were there because the waters wanted to flow in their courses. He thought the cloud was there because it was so. He thought the, the thunder, the lightning, everything was the way they were because they were occurrences in nature. And when God showed up in Job chapter 38 verse 1, he said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Who is this that speaks out of tone because it's obviously bereft of requisite intelligence in interacting with the divine? And in verse 31 of that scripture, God began to ask him questions that inform the borderlines of creation. It's natural that you woke up this morning and you thought you were awake because of biological process. Until the, the Lord appears to you and begins to ask you, by what intelligence are the bones formed in her that is with child? Until God begins to ask you again, by what intelligence does the breath on your nostril, how is it sustained on your nostril? Then for the first time it will turn on you that everything happening around you is supernatural. And that you have been summoned to walk with an invincible spirit that sustains the supernatural stature. An awareness will come to you. And then you will have to, if you are reasonable, contemplate why you were put here. So we wanted to look at the matters of our lives that bordered on purpose. We wanted to look at what life itself was about. But unfortunately, time could not afford us that privilege last night. So tonight, I want to show you some of the heavy molecules that God considers when He deals with humankind. And some of us will realize that these things are not part of our lives. So, but, paraventure, we leave this world today and we get to eternity. We will just realize that we didn't appear in the radar of heaven. It's possible that a man will cross from time to eternity and then it will down on him that even though he breathed oxygen for 90 years, he never appeared in the radar of heaven. 
that man would have been a waste of divine supply. Because what you don't realize is that the air on your nostrils, the life that you live, is an investment of divinity. And by the time life and time is accomplished, God will ask questions as touching the things that he has given to you. And every man that fails to maximize those divine investments in his soul will discover that he is a waste as far as the equation of divinity is concerned. And when God comes to judge among men, such people will not have a place with God. This is why we cry every day that by all means our lives will count. Because it's possible to walk through time and your life never counts. That's the greatest affliction of humankind. That a man will walk through time and his life will not count. When you cross to eternity, there is no privilege of redemption. There is no privilege of making amends. There is no privilege of correction. Life is so deadly. <laughs> it's like a scientific research. You see, when you carry out a research, you spend the time, the money and everything. It's at the end of the research you will find out whether you were correct or not. You would have wasted all the resources. The drugs they produce sometimes take 20 years to get into the market. When you have spent all the billions and then you get into the market, you now discover that that drug was a poison. Then you have to destroy everything and begin again. A man can cross to eternity and when everything, mercy, grace has been dispensed on his life, then he realizes that with the provision of grace and mercy, God will say he didn't leave because he didn't appear on the radar of heaven. Kenneth Hagin was a pastor for 13 years. When Jesus appeared to him, Jesus told him, you have taken your first step into your prophetic call. So for 13 years as a pastor, serving the Lord with all his heart, he had not begun to scratch what was written concerning him. What a waste that life would have been if he did not join into the spirit to find out what was written concerning his destiny. Moses lived in Egypt for 40 years. The angels that were writing his story on earth had nothing to write. So the life of a man for 40 years was only in 8 verses. 8 verses of the Bible. 40 years of his life there was nothing to write. And even in those 8 verses of the Bible nothing was written about him. It was the things that happened when he had no consciousness or no participatory ability that were written. For himself the angels that were writing his story had nothing to write for 40 years. The day the scribe began to write his story was the day the Bible said and Moses came of age. The day Moses' life began to count was the day Moses began to walk according to the dictates of ordination. Could it be that you have lived for the past 19 years? Could it be that you have lived for the past 23 years? And if we were to check your dossier in heaven, there is no score. Is it possible that all this while, with the mercy of God and the grace of God that has been lavished on your life, nothing has been added to heaven on your account? What if the Lord appears tonight and calls upon your name and wants to speak concerning you? Could it be that you have not even discovered the reason you are here? This is why we cry. I told you there is nothing wrong in making progress in life. There is nothing wrong, wrong in prospering in life. We are all making the most of life. But I say everything we achieve in life, we count if that thing is squandered on the reason for which we came here. God is too intelligent to bring you here for no reason. The first reason we cry for revival is so that we will become like unto the Father. In nature and in essence, being like Him and doing exactly what He wants us to be and do. If you don't know what to cry about, 
You may cry all your life, but you will amount to nothing. If you don't know what to live for, you may spend all your life reading and spending all you have, but it will be a wasted investment. Where does life begin to have meaning from? were more than 30 years old but they have not found out why they were born they had an occupation they had a life they were married but they have not found out why they were born and for the first time Jesus will speak and the meaning of their lives will be communicated he said follow me and we make you fishers of men so the reason these guys were born was not to fish fish but to fish men they never found it for more than 30 years. They were married men. They say, follow me. Follow me. There is a voice. Every man must hear for his life to have meaning. If you have not heard it, men may clap for you, but you will be light in heaven. The men that truly live their lives, Jesus calls them overcomers. It is angels that clap for them. They have rank. They have fame. They have popularity in the spirit realm. It doesn't matter the occupation they were doing, but everything they did counted in heaven. You must not be on the microphone. In the political corridor, you can be more popular in heaven than an apostle. In the market, you can be more popular in heaven than an apostle. It is not title based, it is ordination based. Why were you born? A lot have not discovered it. So they live life pursuing opportunities. They live life pursuing chance and luck. They live life pursuing privileges. A young man of 30 years graduated from school. He is waiting for an uncle to call him and say, come to Lagos. And then he leaves for Lagos and he thinks he has begun to succeed in life for 30 years. You don't know why you were born. There is an error. There is a cardinal deficiency in the way we were trained. 40 years old. How are you doing? We are managing. We are trying to survive. Because to him, it's when there is money in his pocket that life begins to count. What a shame. 30 years old. What are you doing now? Nothing. He may even have a job. But every Friday, he squanders his money in the club. He said he's having fun. He has not even had enough sense to understand why he has resources. 30 years old. There's a deficiency. On campus, 90% Christians go to the lecture hall on Monday. You find 50% naked. But they are going to church. They have not understood the meaning of life. They don't even know why they come before the Lord. They think it's a religious practice because they carry them from age one to church with their parents. They went to church every Sunday. So Sunday is a, is a church business. They just appear with their best dress, come to church. And the moment they are leaving church, their real life begins to manifest. Very calm and sober in church. Walk to take the Holy Communion and two hands are like this. Come to give offering and they are sober. But on Monday morning, the lady becomes a slave queen as they are called. 168 hours in a week. They spend three hours in church as fake people and spend 165 hours living as daughters of Jezebel. That's who they really are. A young man's processing in the mind, everything about his mind is about pleasure. A man who is supposed to define the meaning of others 
a man who is supposed to be a trailblazer and chart the course for others. Truly, we need a revival. Much activities in church, many churches, many pastors, but there are no burning ones. Leaders, pastors, over one billion Christians. 2.6 billion Christians in the world. But you cannot enter any of the mountains of influence and say there is a pillar burning. But one man will rise in Israel by the name John. And Jesus will come and say he was a burning and a shining light. And you were willing to dwell in his life for a season. He said the whole of Judea, the whole of Judea and Jerusalem went to one man in the wilderness. No title, no occupation, but he just stayed there because he discovered that according to what was written concerning him, his name in the spirit realm is the voice of the one crying. So when you ask him, who are you? He will not tell you I am John. They gave him John in time. He knows what his nomenclature is in heaven. Who are you? I'm the voice of the one crying. That's how they know me in heaven. So on earth, his voice kept echoing. Echoing from the borders of the wilderness. And the whole city will go to hear him. He was not telling them they will prosper. He was crying against their iniquity. But they could not resist him. Because everything he was doing was written concerning him. What will happen if 10 of us discover who we are? On this small campus, what will happen if 10 of us discover who we are? Somebody met John Wesley. They had to drive him from the whole city. Nowhere to open a church or preach. The only land they had was his father's grave. And he went and stood on it. You couldn't drive him from his father's grave. And there he gathered the whole city. And somebody asked him, how are you able to do this? And he said, I set myself on fire. The people come to watch me burn. How beautiful it is when a man discovers who he is. To ask people, why are you here? Who are you? They begin to define themselves by what people say about them. I am Dr. Matthew. I am Apostle Peter. I am the dad. But nothing to show that the supernatural realm backs them up. We need a revival. We need a revival. It's a shame for me to call myself a Christian. And the guy who is in my room, my Christianity has not impacted him. And every day I stand up, I gather myself around people that believe in what I believe. And then we are, we are, we are hailing ourselves. Hey, man of God, oh God, the prophet of God. Meanwhile, your roommate doesn't notice that anything is happening in your life. Apostle Peter, Apostle Joseph. But the small cubicle where you are living, you are three. You are the only one that knows Jesus. You come to make noise say that you are speaking in tongues every night. But nothing from your life affects them. It's a shame we don't evaluate ourselves. We are so impressed by what we do. But the world doesn't even notice what we are doing. You come to church, they say they are praying, they are praying at the garden. And ten of them, gaba, 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 wah, wah, wah. And then they are falling down, they are rolling everywhere. The next corner, five meters away, somebody is, is romancing again. He doesn't even notice what they are doing. He gets up. Hey! Hey! God is coming. They don't even hear you. Won't you go back and, and, re, and reappraise yourself? I am, I am a prophet. I am a prophet. Every two years, somebody dies in your family. You are pursuing men of God. And you have been a Christian for ten years. We need a revival. The devil is having a few days because men have not woken up to the dictates of their ordination. When I look into history and I see the men God used, most of them had no charisma. Most of them didn't look like it. Most of them were obviously weak and frail. I looked upon Catherine Coleman's picture. I kept looking at her. I said, how can this woman shake the world? How is it possible? Then I understood 
that the reason we are failing is because we are full of ourselves. We have not come before the Lord with an honest heart. We need a revival. We say we have everything, but we have nothing to show. What an irony. Before you cough, he says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Before you cough, he says, I know who I am. I know who I am. Nothing to show. Nothing to show. And he has been saying, Darkness in the land. Darkness in the family. Meanwhile, a girl of 10 years is initiated into witchcraft. And that night she begins to fly. That night she can wreck a family. A girl of 10 years in the witchcraft coffin enters a family and she destroys the whole family. You will bring a band of prayer warriors. They can't even deliver her. We carry big Bibles. And when we walk, creating impression among ourselves, it's a shame. We need a revival. How was that girl taught the ways of the spirit? Her mind is not even yet mature. How was she taught the art of spiritual dynamics? That at the age of 10, she knows what to say and somebody dies. How was she able to grow in that level of wickedness that she can wipe out the whole family in so much dexterity, skill and intelligence? You can't even discern it. How do these people teach their protégés in the negative supernatural? That we come and shout in church for many months and somebody who is struggling with adultery, immorality, drunkenness, lying, cannot stop. Meanwhile, an innocent 10 year old girl, a witch just meets her and in one week she's already a witch. How do they teach their own people? How do they do their own business? That they become so proficient. And we will keep running religious routines. This is why we cry. We cry. Sometimes I come to church. While you are greeting the people. People are already falling everywhere. And then I look to heaven and I ask God. What will become of these people after they are falling? When they fall and they rise up and they go home, what will become of them? Preachers have become even so precious. Precious that they come for meeting until people fall down and they've not done anything. What becomes of these people? After they roll on the floor. I went back to the hotel yesterday and I told God, You are talking, people are running everywhere. Screaming. I said, Lord, touch their hearts. I'm tired of the show. Touch their hearts. What was it that Peter did? That Peter will speak to people. He was not even preaching. He just told them about Jesus. The same Jesus you crucified is today exalted both as Lord and Christ. And the Bible said their heart was caught. And 3,000 people gave their hearts to Christ. Why did he speak that language he spoke? One man goes to stay in the wilderness and the whole city goes to meet him there. Here we have meeting, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, we are on Instagram, everywhere. But we cannot command the influence that this man commanded when they had no publicity strategy or material. We need a revival. You ain't, you ancient Zion king, Kado Oskado, you are mighty on your throne. You ain't, you ancient Zion king, Kado Oskado. You are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion King. Kadosh, Kadosh. 
you are mighty on your soul. A man carries this microphone, preaching for more than 20 years, and he's living in immorality for more than 10 years. And then you come to carry this microphone, and you are telling people about righteousness. He doesn't know the fear of God. You are warning people, challenging people, talking to people about the wrath of God. Meanwhile, you are a preacher in immorality for seven years. And then they catch them. Then you come out and say, Guinness, to win the sentiment of people. How were you able to preach all those years? Do you know what you are talking about? We read Bible and we think it's about Bible. We talk Bible. The men that walk with God, that the Bible says we should look upon as an example. In their days, there was no Bible. The Bible said, Enoch walked with God and was not. He said, God bore him testimony that he pleased him. There was no scriptures. How did he know how to walk with God? He said, when God warned Noah, he moved out of reverence and built the ark. And he said, by it, he became the heir of righteousness that is of faith. How did he know the fear of God? He was not reading any document. He said, when Abraham, God called Abraham, he moved. How did he know obedience? How did he enter into the protocol of faith? Had he not read any document? We reduce spiritual things to traditions, to dogmas, to acts and philosophies. A man is coming to talk about revival, whereas himself is dead in the spirit. Because he thinks revival is an intelligent teaching. He doesn't know revival is the fire of God consuming a soul. A man who should be praying and begging God to set him on fire comes to talk to people about revival. Meanwhile, he is dead in the spirit. And worst case scenario, some people argue that there is nothing like revival. <laughs> Too much knowledge. Philosophies have shut the gate of the spirit realm from us. Somebody is a Christian for 10 years, he doesn't know the voice of God. 10 years as a Christian, he doesn't know the voice of God. How have you been walking? The decisions you've been making, how have you been making them? 10 years as a Christian, you don't know the voice of God. You ask, you take a census in church and say, when was the last time God spoke to you? You will be shocked. You may not even see one hand. How have we been surviving? Meanwhile, all of us have titles. All of us are preachers on Facebook. Somebody sees something that he should meditate on to save his soul. As they see it, he's sharing it. He has not even meditated on it. He feels others need to hear it. Meanwhile, that message is for him. Sometimes I have too much burden that I can't share the word of God. I just wish we could cry and keep crying and keep crying and keep crying. Because it's as if everything has been taught. Any topic you want, click on Google, you will see five to seven messages on it. But there's no life in our spirit, man. We are weak. We are weak. We say, program, a man of God is coming, people gather. But eventually the man doesn't come, you know, say, let's pray for five hours. You'll be shocked that even the man on the pulpit cannot stand for five hours. You reign, you ancient Zion King, Kadosh Kadu, you are my river flow, river flow. 
Let it sound a river flow in your church once again. Let it sound it be You know, I thought I loved the Lord some years ago. I think about six, seven years ago. Can't remember. I said, Lord, whatever I have belongs to you. <laughs> And then I received my first hundred thousand. <laughs> and then the Lord came for hundred thousand. <laughs> you know, I have this saying, I'm always saying, spiritual experience is not doctrine. Doctrine is very important. Doctrine is the only basis for preserving the heritage of God in every generation. Doctrine is what defines the borderline of our experience. Outside of truth, every experience we have is a lie or is from the devil. Doctrine is the security system that God puts in place in order to preserve a generation. But we need to journey beyond doctrine into experience so that we can really know the things that are encapsulated in doctrine. I thought I knew the Lord, I loved the Lord. Because everybody was saying, Lord, whatever you want, I will do. So we'll go for prayer meeting for five hours. We are on the wall, we are waiting. Lord, if you call me, I will not fail you. Anything you want, I will give you. And then 100,000 showed up. And the moment 100,000 came, everything I needed to do became like a mountain. <laughs> Brief 100,000. That was when I understood that love has many definitions. We need to cry. If God doesn't help you, your heart will fail you. You will think you are strong. You will think you will stand for God until something is manipulated from the spiritual realm. <laughs> Apostle will always tell us that anything that is orchestrated from the spiritual realm will overwhelm mortality. Because by reason of ranking, the immortal realm is superior to the mortal realm. That's why you can be a professor of pneumatology. But a, a boy of 15 years that knows how to manipulate the spirit realm can violate what you know. You can be a professor emeritus. But a girl of 15 years in the witchcraft kobo can make you paralyzed. Your knowledge will be in your head. But that girl is interfacing a realm that is superior to the realm of your operation. You are functioning from the soulish realm, the preternatural realm. The gear is operating from the supernatural realm. So you can recite something for two hours. She comes and makes her hand. Pop, and she releases the demon. Because she's operating from a higher realm. We need to cry and press until we break into the immortals. Until we enter into the boundary of their dwelling. And begin to define our lives from their perspective. Until we begin to see ourselves the way they see us. And we are able to manipulate the modalities that they put in place. We cannot have relevance with them. Ask the Lord to talk to your heart one more time. I will soon begin to fly. So that you are not left behind. You don't want to hear the preacher tonight. You don't want service as usual. Where you are excited, you jump and you say, Boo! Boo! This is a powerful service. And then after one week, you find yourself crying again. Because the things that you thought you overcame on account of the euphoria of the service, after three days, that excitement dies. And then those things confront you again. And you discover you didn't build up. The cure to your plague is the activation of the word of God in your spirit by the Holy Ghost. Can you ask the Lord to talk to your heart? I'm not be sharing for too long. I will just strike some calls and then if the, if the realm opens, then we will begin to move by the Spirit. River flow, river flow, let it turn a river flow in your church once again. 
let it tarnish this name. River flow, river flow. Let it stand, oh river flow. In your church once again. Let it tarnish this name. In every generation, God has a definite purpose. And the reason God brings us into different generations is because our appearance is dependent on the generation where our participation and role in the purpose of God is calculated into. The reason you didn't show up here 100 years ago is because there was no purpose for you in God 100 years ago. The reason you are here today is because it's in this day and time that you can future in the purpose of God. You know, it's like a movie. You begin to watch a movie. You have a major character that runs through all of the movie. But different characters begin to appear in the movie depending on when they are supposed to participate in the corporate expression of the purpose of that movie. So you can't just show up unless the time for your act is is playing out. That's when you can teach up. So the reason you showed up now is because there's a corporate thing God is doing that you have a role to play in. You will count if you find that thing and you do it. And in every dispensation where God is working, there are definite counsels that define the borderline for that which God wants to do in that dispensation. Man that will be relevant in that dispensation must find the counsel of God for him in that dispensation. As he begins to walk by it, then he becomes relevant. The challenge is not that God has a purpose that can be achieved. The challenge is that the realm is open to other entities apart from God. If God is the only entity in this realm that determines the outcome of reality, you would have just slept and then woke up and began to fulfill the purpose of God for your life. But unfortunately, God is not the only one that is in this game. When God began the project of creation, creation was sealed from every other entity that had power and authority to participate in the game. And God handed over the key to humankind in the form of his obedience to his laws. And so long as man stayed obedient to God, creation was locked away from every other entity that had the power to participate in fulfilling their own mandate that is different from the mandate of God. But Adam did not understand the implication of disobedience. You know, when God speaks to you sometimes, you don't understand the implication. God can come to you at night and say, Victor, from today, pray in tongues between 12 and 1 a.m. You have heard stories about men that prayed in tongues and things happened. But now God has told you pray in tongues. You may think God just wants you to build your prayer life. You don't understand the implication of what God has told you to do. Meanwhile, according to the economy of God, you know he's called the Alpha and Omega. The word Alpha and Omega means beginning and end. It's not beginning and end. It means God is at the same time in the beginning and at the same time in the end. So it means God is the one that encompasses everything that plays out in expression in time. So when God shows up and says, pray in tongues between 12 and 1 a.m. And maybe at this time you were 21 years old or you were 24 years old. So you thought, ah, God wants me to build my prayer life. So you go for fellowship and you say, oh boy, God came to me yesterday and said, I should begin to pray from 12 to 1. You have not sat down to contemplate how God operates. So you thought what God told you was story. So for three months you violate it. And every night your heart begins to beat. You feel uncomfortable. You become restless. What you don't know is that whether you will become anything big in this life may be dependent on that one instruction. Because the day that you will need favor, 10 years later, you may not have the opportunity to pray. So God went 10 years into your future. And when he discovered that what you are supposed to do by favor, you cannot achieve that favor. In order to keep you in the boundary of safety, he came 10 years into the past and gave you an instruction. Say, pray between 12 and 1. 
You, in your own mundane expression, you thought God wanted you to increase your prayer capacity. You don't know that God is creating an insurance policy for your future. So for those six months, when those instructions came, you may violate the prayer. And then 15 years later, you come to where your life should be defined. And then you begin to cry, Lord, have mercy. What you don't know is that 15 years ago, Lord already released mercy. But you violated the protocol of mercy. Such was the crisis of Adam when God showed up in the garden of Eden. He said, do not eat this fruit. In the day you eat of it, you shall die. Adam did not even know what death meant. Maybe his own expression. You know, Adam had some level of understanding. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 19, the Bible said, God asked him to name the animals. And he said, every name that Adam gave the animals was the name thereof. That means, to a very large extent, Adam had the power to tap into the boat of Zion and to peep into things that were locked in the chambers of heaven. So Abraham, Adam was operating at some level of wisdom, at some level of insight. So when God told him, if you eat of this fruit, you will die. Perhaps he thought that death was cessation of life. Perhaps he thought that death was departure from mortality. He didn't understand what God meant. When God said, if you eat this fruit, you shall die. He didn't know that the key of all the realms of God hinged on that instruction. The day Adam ate that fruit, that day, he handed over his authority to Satan. Satan became the god of this world. Adam never realized that while he was in this world, he was a god. So death was beyond cessation from mortal body. Death was actually dethronement of spiritual authority. Death was actually stepping away from ordination so that another entity can walk into it. So when God gives an instruction and you violate it, you may think you will come back later and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then you cry from morning to night. And because you release tears, biochemical processes take place and then you are relieved. And you say, oh, thank God, I'm forgiven. And then you go back to the fellowship, you carry the mind, you say, go, go. <laughs> you didn't know that because you violated that authority, something has happened. Somebody else has been coronated. That assignment you were carrying out was a throne in the realm of the spirit. The law for sitting on that throne was what God told you. That looked like a one sentence statement. Yes, you will ask for forgiveness, God will forgive you. But what has happened? You have lost your place. Did you know why the Bible says giving no place to the devil? Because a place is where you stand and you exercise spiritual authority. So Adam thought eating the fruit was just an act of disobedience. That forgiveness can remit him with. But what happened to him is that he lost his place of authority. So when God showed up in the garden, God could not find Adam anymore. Where Adam was standing in the spirit realm, he had lost that place. It was Satan that was standing there now. So God showed up. He said, Adam, Adam, where are thou? Adam said, I hid myself. No, you can't hide from God. What has happened is that you have lost your place. So the authority you have to preserve the earth has been taken from you. So when Satan came to tempt Jesus on the Mount of Temptation, he said, bow down to me and I will give you all that you see and the glory thereof. For it has been handed over to me. So what gave Adam authority over the earth? That was what he, he, he bargained away when he decided to disobey God. As if that was not enough. <laughs> Satan did not only come into the world, he came with all his government functionaries. Death was one of them. Because Adam did what? Violated a simple instruction. These are some of the things that people are not taught. So you think you can fornicate because you felt, oh, I couldn't stop myself. And then you ask for forgiveness. God will forgive you. But there are things you will never enter in life again. Not because God is wicked. But things are at different energy levels in the spirit. There, is, there are certain things you do that your soul can no longer ascend to touch realities that are in high energy levels. Hope you know the Bible says, when we wait upon the Lord, we mount up with wings like the eagles. When you come high, you become like God. In Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28, it said, God is the only one. It said, have you not heard? Have they not been said to you that the everlasting God fainted not, neither is he weary? He said, he giveth power to the faint, and unto them that have no might, he increases strength. So, according to that scripture, God is the only entity that doesn't know how to faint. 
He doesn't know how to be weary. So even if God works for one year, the more he works, he will be the way he is. God can't faint, he can't be weary. But man naturally has the ability to faint. But God said there's a technology in himself that when you wait on him, you mount up. So when you come higher in verse 31, he said you will run, you will not be weary. You will walk, you will not faint. So there is a place in heaven, there's a place in a height in the spirit that if a man can get to, then he can begin to function like God. Now, there are certain things you do, just the way if you wait on God, something happens to your soul and your soul ascends. And you can begin to walk in possibilities that are only prerogatives of God. There are other things that if you do, instead of your soul ascending, your soul will deplete. The ability to walk and not faint and run and not be weary, it's in the place in the spirit. When you wait on God, you go to that place. But there is also another thing. When you do certain things, your soul deplete. And then you can no longer walk in dimensions that were your best right. You can no longer walk in dimensions that are your heritage. So this is why every hour we cry for revival. Because we know that there is something God wants to do in this generation. That there is an energy level we must hit in the spirit before we can achieve it. When the devil comes to fight you, he will not waste his resources on every part of you. The devil will look for that thing that will make it possible for you to fulfill the agenda of God. That is what the devil will fight. That is why our battles are different. Somebody else's battle is lying because there's a trigger on his tongue. Somebody else's battle is immorality because he has the eyes of an eagle. The devil wants to blind him in the spirit. If he's blind, if he lies, he should pray for money tonight. He cannot do what God wants him to do. The guy that is three guys on his tongue, if his tongue is corrupt, no matter what he do, he cannot fulfill the agenda of God. Somebody else is three guys in his hand. So when the devil comes to fight, he will fight you based on where your greatest strength lies. And if he can break it, he has crippled you. For Adam, his strength was in keeping the instructions of God. And Adam did not understand that every other thing depended on it. And he violated it. This is the trick the devil has used in every generation. And every time a generation notices that the devil is beginning to strike them on their Achilles heels, a generation begins to cry. So that help will come from Zion. Because the generation knows that if the devil is able to cripple them, then they are lost in the calendar of heaven. It's possible for a whole generation to be lost. This is why we cry revival. In the days of John the Baptist, there was darkness for 400 years. There was no prophet. God had promised through Isaiah that a prophet will rise and he will open the door for the Messiah to come. The devil knew. So the devil began to cripple the prophetic. If there is no prophet to declare the coming of the Messiah, then the Messiah will not come. I may not be able to stop the Messiah from coming, but I know the protocol. The protocol is that a prophet will announce his coming. The moment a prophet announces his coming, the door is open. So what will I do? I can't fight God in heaven, but I can stop the prophetic on earth. So for 400 years, there was darkness. There was no prophet. And so long as there was no prophet, the Messiah didn't show up. Two men began to pray. Enos, the prophet. Simon, the prophet, they began to pray day and night, day and night, until a point came, God had to promise Simeon, he said, you will not see death until you see the salvation of Israel. This man prayed until a voice rose. You know, I told you something about intercession yesterday. I say you may be an intercessor, you may not be known, but you will be shocked that the heaviest reward will rest with you. Even John the Baptist did not know that the reason a prophet emerged after 400 years of darkness was because of Enos and Simeon. Pray for their lives. I, Zacharias and Elizabeth were also praying. They were praying for a son. They didn't understand the bigger purpose. So God had no promise for them concerning what he wanted to do. But these were men that knew that for the Messiah to come, a prophet must rise. So their prayer point was about the Messiah. About the Messiah. 
and when their prayer hit a crescendo in the spirit, God released John. And the angel could not wait. Why John was in his mother's womb, he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. God was urgent to do what he wanted to do. God was in a hurry to do what he wanted to do. Because for 400 years, the devil understood how to violate the protocol. There was no prophetic voice in Israel. The reason no prophet rose was not because prophets were not born, but because there was something the devil did that kept them in darkness. Hope you know that when Jesus finally came, the Bible said the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, Matthew 4, 16, he said the people that dwelt in darkness. So everybody that had a mandate that showed up was covered in darkness. You will not know what God wants to do in this territory because there may be darkness. So everybody that comes here with a potential, the devil knows what to do. Maybe your own trigger is on your tongue and from the day you enter the campus, from that day, the devil puts a gist on your tongue. And for four years, you talk that story until you leave. Everybody knows you as the biggest Barcelona fan. So the man who should prophesy the move of God in this campus is the one that analyzes everything about Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. Everywhere he comes, they begin to, hey, ah, 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 see the football analyst. Then he walks like this. And then he, after two seconds, he begins to talk. In 1996, when Barcelona prayed Real Madrid, on the 21st minute, he is quoting with precision. He doesn't know that they have put a plague on his tongue. That tongue is supposed to be the trigger that unlocks the potentials of God on this campus. But the devil knows. The guy that came that's supposed to be a lead among the intercessors. Maybe what God brought him to the campus to do was to raise the Deborah generation. Because God knows that the heritage of, of, of the, his heritage on this campus dwelt with the young ladies. So he came on campus. Every lady is attracted, drawn to him. And then he thought it was about his beard. So he begins to shape the beers like this. When they are in the lecture hall, he sits at the back. And then three girls are here, three are here. All right, no problem. After the lecture, he walks like this. And then one girl holds here, another girl holds here. That is the man who is supposed to raise the Deborah generation. But the devil puts an insatiable appetite for sex in his bowels. So the devil understood that the prophetic was the only thing that could usher in the Messiah for 400 years. There was no prophet. A strategy, a protocol from the demonic realm was activated and it shut down every prophetic voice. Until two men began to cry revival. And when their prayers ascended to the heavens, God himself came and promised Simeon that you will see it in your lifetime. And John rose. The moment John rose, a revival began. The Bible said the whole Jerusalem, the whole Judea went to him in the wilderness. A revival had begun. Suddenly, the consciousness of God was awoken in the heart of people. These were people that wake up in the morning and they go to brothels. They were enjoying themselves and living their lives. But all of a sudden, the voice has risen. And everybody is heading into the wilderness. To hear John, everybody is on his way to the wilderness. A revival has begun. Revival is a reawakening of the consciousness of God and his operation in our soul. It's possible for you to be born again, but there will be no consciousness of God in your spirit. Paul said in Galatians, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, he said, If you are dead in Christ, he said, therefore, let your mind and your affection be on the things that are above. So it is possible to be a believer, but the only thing that forms your consciousness is your appetite. What will you eat? What will you drink? What will you wear? When the revival begins, the consciousness of men is reprogrammed back to God. Men begin to seek the face of God, and only then can the mandate of heaven play out of time. Remember, Jesus said, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is man that has the authority to bring the will of God that is in heaven to pass on earth. But when men are not conscious of God, the will of God will remain locked in heaven. The problem is that God will not lose. Because even before he began to create, he was God. When creation is over, he will still be God. It is man, it is that generation that will lose. 
This is why we cry revival. So that men can become conscious of God again and live their lives based on the command power that is in the office of the Christ. When you take a census in church, you'll be amazed what informs predominantly the consciousness of people. Predominantly. If you were to take an appraisal of yourself in the next one minute, you will know what your consciousness is. If your consciousness is not predominantly God, you need a revival. Some come on campus and they find a girlfriend, a boyfriend, and for four months, you just see them smiling. Every time they are on their phone, quack, 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 what's up? They are smiling, they are just talking. What is happening? That boy has become their consciousness. You need a revival. Some is only their exam. Your exam is your primary objective in this campus. Very important. Make it your priority. But your exam should never take the place of God. Your studies should never take the place of God. Because the reason you must prosper is so that you can be relevant in the agenda of God. It's not the agenda of God that will be relevant in your exam. There are many people that think God is out to make them pass exam. God will make you pass exam. But remember, everything you are and become should be relevant for God. Not God be relevant for what you have. If those priorities are not well defined, there will be crisis. And this is the crisis we have. Because we were not taught correctly. Somebody made a statement very profound. He said, God is not interested in your purpose. He said, God is interested in his purpose and your part in that purpose. The devil knows. When the devil gives to men, he will first of all educate them to know that everything he's giving them is about himself. And these men know they don't joke with it. Have you seen a wealthy man that got his money from the waters? Everything he has is about the devil. He will never joke with it. Because that's how spirits operate. The reason God doesn't use force on you is because God wants it to be an act of worship. If you are forced, if you are compelled, if you are manipulated, it's no longer worship. It's no longer a faith action. And the Bible said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So God wants you to be the one to seek Him, not Him comparing you to Him. And that has left a lot of people in a state of lethargy. Need revival. We need revival. What is your predominant consciousness? If it is not God, you need revival. That's why revival is not shouting and running. Revival is not screaming and acting in a hysteric fashion. Sometimes the presence of God becomes strong. Your emotions are overwhelmed. But it's beyond emotion, brother. When you depart and you are alone, when you are in the lecture hall, when you are in the market, what is your consciousness? What do you live for? And what can God entrust into your hand? That is revival. A point comes when God releases his spirit upon a generation. And then he commissions a generation to do what was not happening on earth before. A revival has begun. Because a consciousness has been created. Can I tell you something? God is not just out to begin a revival. It's revival is God wants to raise. It's one thing to have a revival. And people are moving after God because somebody is leaving, leaving them. It's another thing to have a clan of revivalists where everybody is burning. That's what God wants to do. So God is not bringing a revival. God is raising revivalists. So that all of us can be a clan of burning people. But it begins with consciousness. And the devil will want to destroy that thing that forms your strength. That thing that forms the block and the foundation of your spiritual consciousness. If you study the book of Acts, chapter 4, from verse 1 to 4. Peter was going to the temple with John in Acts chapter 3. They had healed the man that was born lame. And on account of the miraculous dimension of God that broke upon them, something began in the temple. And the Bible said they began to preach to the people. They laid hands on them, baptized them in the Holy Spirit. And it said that day alone, 3,000 was added to the church. And suddenly the elders, the St. Henry, shows up and arrested them. 5,000 people rather converted in one meeting. The elders came and arrested them. And what did the elders do to them? Look at the scripture. How be it many of them which heard the word believed and the number of men that were was about 5,000. 
The same message that they were preaching, something broke upon them. They preached that message, and in one day, 5,000. Go to the next verse, and see what the elders did. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and the elders and Enos the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Next. And when they had set them in the midst they asked them by what power or by what name have you done this? The man that was healed at the beautiful gate. How did you do this? They began to interrogate them. They began to threaten them. They began to rain havoc on them. So that what informed their conviction. I want to show you what the devil does to you. So that when you leave this meeting, you will know what to protect. Some of you may leave this meeting and your prayer altar will be revived. So apart from the experience in the meeting, that prayer altar that is revived is your reviver. So long as you monitor it and keep it burning, you will burn. Some of you will leave this meeting, this conference, and then the word of the Lord will come alive in your spirit. The hunger for the word will begin. Stay there. When the devil comes to fight, he will not fight everything about you. He will fight that thing that was awakened. Some of you is fasting. The hunger for fasting will be born again. The devil will come to fight it. Some of you, what will be born will be the quest for evangelism. Those are the things the devil will fight. I want to show you how the devil strategizes. In your church, once again, learn eternity between. Go to verse 8 quickly. After they had threatened them, the Bible said, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means is it made, is he, by what means he is made whole? Be it known unto you all. The man began to preach. He began to preach Jesus to them again. And in verse 13, the Bible said something. The men saw the miraculous. They could not deny it because the man that was healed stood with them. But there was something they saw in them that was the basis for their motivation. It was their boldness. They saw that the boldness these guys had, these guys have, they will take over the whole Jerusalem. And see what the Bible said. And now when they saw their boldness, the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. And they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they were with Jesus. That dimension of boldness was the greatest threat. These men saw that it was not just the miraculous. The courage and the boldness these men have. We caused them to walk into fire. And that was what was lacking. And if they continue with this boldness, something will go wrong. You will leave a meeting and have an encounter. The devil will know that if you continue with this hunger for prayer, something will happen. So when he comes, he will fight your prayer altar. The devil can begin to bless you that time. You don't understand. I told you there is a politics that go on in the realm. If the devil sees that your attention has been drafted to your prayer altar, the devil can make three people to begin to look for your attention. You were on campus the 300 level. You were struggling to have a girlfriend. No girl had your time. You now went for a meeting. You came back. Your altar was hot. You began to pray every night. And suddenly, every evening, a lady shows up and says, Hmm, so you like this, don't forget me, ba. Where are you coming from? See, <laughs> there are times when I come and I burn like fire. But there are times when you show people the little, little secrets that they underrate. You don't forget me, but this lady has not called you for six months. Why is it now that fire is beginning to burn on your altar? She shows up on her own. You don't forget me, but And then that you don't forget me, but the devil puts an amplifier. And then you hear it. You go to lie down like this. You don't forget me, but You don't forget me, but You don't forget me.
The lady you bought 1,500 naira recharge card for that didn't send you a text to say thank you. Now you went for a meeting, you came back. There was a button to eat the word of God. And then you began reading. And then you see a text message. Hi, Peter. Are you around at all? Hmm. You, you know the check on person again, no? And then suddenly Peter begins to think of his phone. He wants to, you want to carry the phone and the Holy Ghost says, hmm. Peter doesn't know that manipulation is already going on in the realm. You carry the phone, you want to die the number. It's as if your heart wants to melt. The Holy Ghost moves in your heart. Don't! Peter. Peter, 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 Peter is now battling between life and death. Battling between. If you make that call, you are gone. Even if heaven moves, you are gone. Because the whole support heaven has for you has already been revealed. Peter, you want to die. If you are wise, that's the time to shut down everything and begin to pray in tongues. Pray in tongues for three hours until all that emotion dies. Then ask yourself, why should I call her? Don't you notice what happened? Jesus was walking the air doing miracles. The devil was not moved. The moment Jesus said he wanted to go to Jerusalem, the devil knew he was heading for the cross. Instantly, the man that moved in the Holy Ghost, Peter, was the the devil came instantly and Peter drew Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Jesus knew it was not Peter. They get behind me, Satan. For thou suffereth not the things that be of God, but of man. This is why Jesus survived. At the brink of time, when he had accepted to make all the sacrifice, the devil came again. Jesus will go to Gethsemane. He would mobilize prayer support, the Son of God. Mobilize prayer support. And Jesus will go and throw himself on the ground and was begging the Father. Because he knew that if abortion doesn't take place, that thing that was growing in his soul will make him violate the cross. That was the first time you will know that Jesus had a will that was different from the will of the Father. You would never have known. But there was a protocol of darkness that wanted to separate the perfect harmony that was between Jesus and the Father. And Jesus knew that there was a, it's a crisis. So he went, he stayed there until it was aborted. And when it was aborted, the same Jesus that wanted to miss in action showed up and said, let's go, the time has come. You don't know how it works. That's why you keep falling. When the devil comes, he will come for that thing that makes you to stand. The revival meeting will come for nothing unless you understand the intelligence to keep standing. The revival meeting is not so important because you fell down and cried. We know what to do to get people falling and rolling everywhere. I didn't preach yesterday. People were running everywhere. We know what to do. But precepts are the things that make people stand. A fire may come on you and it will be burning on your head literally. But if you don't know what to do to stand, in three days you will dissipate it. The devil comes for your strong bone. He said in verse 18, Mark, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 18. See what the, the Bible said they did to them. He said, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. They didn't stop them from doing their miracles. Go ahead and do your miracles. But never again preach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered, and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. And in verse 20 he said, For we cannot but speak. The argument was not about the miracle. The argument was predicated upon their boldness. If this man remain bold, they will take over this territory. Let's fight it out of them. And in verse 21 he said, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go. Finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all, for all men glorified God for which he has done. He further threatened them. You would not notice what happened in that scripture. But what they did had depleted the boldness of the apostles. And when they returned to their own camp, see their prayer. 
in Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, the same chapter, verse 31. And he says, and when they had prayed, first of all, see the substance of their prayer in verse 29. He said, and now Lord, behold their threatenings. That arrow the devil shot had gotten them in their strongest point. Their boldness was being depleted. Behold, they are threatening and grant unto thy servant that with all boldness they may preach the gospel. This man had understanding on how to preserve the move of God in their lives. They knew the arrow the devil shot and they went for that arrow. Their prayers were not scattered it was effectual and well directed. Behold their threatening. Grant boldness. And in verse 31 the Bible said, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were, assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. You come for a meeting like this, the devil will fashion different weapons for different people. Yours may be on your prayer because that's what the Lord will kindle. Yours may be on your fasting. Yours may be on your giving life. Yours may be on your evangelism life. Find out what the Lord will kindle and guide it jealously. That is what will determine the destiny and the texture of your life. The Holy Ghost will do everything with your cooperation to preserve it. But if you fail to preserve it, you have already wasted the potentials of the meeting. The potentials of the meeting is not necessarily in what happens in... Sometimes we come, we judge based on what happens in the hall. That's where we miss it. What we should look at is not the life in our service. It's the life in our territory. What happens in the territory is the proof of the quality of what is happening in the hall. As we begin to pray this evening, most of you, your altars will be set on fire. Most of you, your work with God will be kindled. You need to guide it. In Revelation chapter 4, chapter 2 verse 4, Jesus gave a testimony about the church in Ephesus. He saw their manifestations. They proved the apostles. He saw the demonstration of God in their midst. He said, I have one thing against you. You have lost your first love. That's a church with the miraculous. That's a church with wonders. But they needed a revival. Their strength in heaven was not the miraculous. Their strength was their intimacy with God. God was their motivation. Before now, they didn't do miracles because they had powers to do miracles. They did miracles because they were motivated of the Spirit to glorify the Father. But they have come to a point where they have mastered how it works. So when they go out, when you challenge them, they do miracles to show you that they are anointed. God said their first love was lost. The moment the first love was lost, the activity was nonsense. Have we not come to a point where we know how to make the church excellent? So we come for the service, we know how to stage the programs. We know how to make things happen in the service. But God is not there. We do all the dancing, we do all the charade in the church, but we go out, God is not in our world. We need a revival. Going back to what really counts and what God is doing in our individual lives. There are lots of people in the church, congregation growing, but you call somebody up and you say, what is God doing in your life now? He doesn't know. Because there's no work with God. We need a revival. What is God doing in your life today? Can you point it out? You need a revival. If you can't point out what God is on, the project God is upon in your life now, you need a revival. The elders of old, their lives instruct me so much. God will come to Enoch, and the only thing God will look and speak concerning Enoch was that Enoch pleased him. Enoch walked with him, so Enoch pleased him. So Enoch guarded his work with the Lord jealously, and God will bear testimony. God will come to Noah and the only thing God will point in Noah's life was that Noah feared the Lord. There were many crazy manifestations in the life of Noah. The ark that took Noah 100 years to build. Noah saw the whole dimension of that ark in a vision. Can you beat that level of word of knowledge? The ark that he built for 100 years. All the dimensions of the ark he was seeing it in the spirit realm and was building it. 
But when God came, He didn't speak about Noah's dexterity in his in the spirit realm. He spoke about the fear of God. And the fear of God in Noah's life became the qualitative assurance for determining what true service is. So your service will only be accepted when there is reverence in your life. So everything Noah did was reverent as far as God was concerned. Abraham's life, with all the move of God, the Bible said Abraham was old and seeking in age. The Lord had blessed him in all things. Abraham was the definition of prosperity. But when God came, God looked at his feet. They knew what to keep. They knew what to guide. Because every day of their life, they know what God is doing. What is God doing in your life? A man who cannot trace what God is doing in his life by time needs a revival. Because he has lost his bearing. You can be a leader in church. God doesn't judge people by church, church ranking. Moses that saw the invisible God, when God showed up, God commended his faithfulness. He said Moses was faithful in all of the house of God. That was what Moses guided. What is that thing in your life that God can define you by? That's the revival of God in your life. Many Christians have lost it. Is it important to pray for blessings? Very, very important. But if you lost what is between you and God, you are lost. Peter came, he said, I have no silver nor gold. He said, but such as I have with God. That's a man born in. Such as I have. They supernatural is your advantage. What is it you have with God? When we come for revival meetings, we want to quicken what we have with God. So that that thing will become the bearing, the defining factor of our lives. There are many people today who are lukewarm. The Bible said, because you are neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So even God rejects men. It's better you are falling and you are seeking help than to be in between. Because even God will reject you. Revival is not running around on the street. Revival is the ability to commend and to bet the move of God. Born in people. Born in people. Born in people. What is it that you have to guide jealously? That's what the Holy Ghost will reveal to you tonight. As you leave this meeting, I want to show you what God will begin to do in your life. And then I'll begin to pray. When you come for the meeting, and the Lord releases the fire on you, then God carries you through a syllabus of training. I will show you in the next five minutes, and then we'll begin to pray. If you look at the stories of revival through the Bible, you will discover that all these men follow this syllabus of training. All of them. They follow this syllabus. I'll just pick a few significant revivers in the scriptures and then I'll show you how God dealt with all of these men. And then you'll discover that the reason certain things happen to your life, happen to you and in your life, is not because you are unfortunate. Some of the things you call crisis, what you don't know, they are actually syllabus in the school of the spirit. Some of the things you call affliction, if you don't know, some of them may be syllabus in the school of the spirit. God wanted to bring you to a point where you can rely on him completely. This is how God raised this revivalist. Revivalists are not born in the classroom. Revivalists are hewn from the cave of fire. They walk through the fire. They walk through the water. They understand what it means to walk through the fire and not to be born. So they can carry the flame of God to their world. They understand what it means to walk through the waters and not be drowned. It's not in the classroom you raise revivalists. I will show you what God does with them. If you look at the days of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham was in the hall of the Chaldees. According to Stephen in Acts of the Apostles chapter 7, the Bible says God had spoken to Abraham when he was in the hall of the Chaldees to leave his country to leave his kindred, to leave his father's house. Abraham never moved. What carried Abraham from 
the hall of the Chaldees to Haran was his own father Terah. So the same way all of us encounter God. Maybe yours may be in a revival meeting. Yours may be in the place of prayer. You encountered God and God wants to begin to train you. And you violate. That's the same way Abraham violated God. He said God had told him. But the man will not move. Until his father died. His father that was the source of his confidence died. Abraham was so connected to his family. That it was difficult for him to break that fraternity. So his confidence was in his bond with his family. So God wanted to detach. That's how God raises survivalists. He detaches you from everything that informs your confidence. God wanted to detach him. He said, leave your country. Leave your kindred. Leave your father's house. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Then I will bless you. He said, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by thee. But what? Depart. Detach. Be separated. An instruction Abraham will not obey until his father died. And when his father died, gathered himself and began to walk out of the land. Yet, he carried Lot. Have you not come for a meeting or gone for a meeting before and you are set on fire and God gives you the same instruction he gave Abraham? Leave everything. And then you are trying to find the justification in departing from some persons. And God insists rigidly leave. And then you fail to depart from those people until a point came that fire died. And then you went back crying and you don't find it. Has it not happened to you before? Set on fire, burning for God. He said, but you have to leave. And then you don't. I have experienced it many times. Many times. Sometimes a revival even come. God tells you to depart from a certain location and go somewhere and retreat for some time. And then you say, okay, I will go next week. Next week come, I will go next week. After some time, the whole fire goes down. And then when there is no fire anymore, you carry to come back. And you say, we are going to a kitchen to Babalola Mountain. We will pray for seven hours. Then you come. When you finish praying, you have headache. You come back home and relax. You frustrate the grace of God. The intelligence of managing and stewarding revival. A lot don't have it. Abraham moved. God began to teach him how to make his hands strong. If your confidence remains on anything apart from God, you are not a candidate of revival. If God wants you to set people on fire, He will carry you through the coals of fire yourself. The hottest crisis of life, sometimes God will allow you to go through it. You will cry many nights. You will, you will scream. You will do everything until you are broken. Then God can break out through you. At that point, like Paul will say, we are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit. Rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence in the flesh. When you see a man get to that level, a revivalist has been born. The Bible says God carried Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12 verse 7, verse 6, he said he took him to Sichem and to Moriah. And from there he carried him to Bethel, to Ai and to Bethel. You read those things, you just thought they were locations. Those things were physical locations, but they were prophetic indications of the kinds of training that Abraham went through. The word Sikem is the word shoulder. The word more is the word teacher. In the ancient days, they carried load and bodies on their shoulders. It's not now that you carry a jerry like this. Those days when you carry a, lo a luggage, a load, a body, you keep it on your shoulder and you move. They carry bodies on their shoulders. So the kind of teaching God was giving Abraham was a kind of teaching that attracted body. So he carried him through the place of the shoulder and he was teaching him the ways of revival. Abraham went through so many crises 
and God was teaching him. So God will stand on the subject of faith for 25 years until he believed. The guy will run to Egypt. God will allow him. When he goes there and is prostrated, then God will come and they will pursue him from Egypt. He will come back to the promised land. It's the dealing of Sikhem. You are praying to God, set this land on fire. Set us on fire. Then God brings you to Sikhem. And then things begin to go wrong. You don't know why. What is happening? Lord, what is happening? Some of us, the day we say God use us, that was the day we created the greatest problem of our lives. Because we were people that trusted in the flesh. And the Bible says, woe unto the man that trusted in flesh. He said, the arm of flesh we fail. Every time God wants to raise the revival, he brings you into the path of seeking. He begins to furnish you with bodies. And then he teaches you the way of the spirit by bodies. You will stay there until you master that syllabus. And the point comes as you gravitate from that place. You will learn a new technology that is beyond what you know. Maybe the technology you know now is the technology of phone call. So every time there's a crisis, there are four uncles that if you call to, something must happen. So you call Lagos. If Lagos doesn't work, Portacot will work. If Portacot doesn't work, Abuja will work. You are a master of the phone technology. You will never be on fire. When God wants to walk, then he separates. He brings you to seek him. And then all of a sudden, you want to call Portacot. Then things go wrong. You call Lagos, things go wrong. You call Abuja, things go wrong. Then you will come for the first time and you will look to the God of heaven. That time you are ready for school. That time your territory is about to be delivered. It is a strategy that God uses for every man that he uses in all generations. Those bodies will keep you there and you will cry many nights until a point comes you will learn something that does not have its root in the bearing of human civilization. The moment Abraham left Sikhen, the Bible said in Genesis chapter 12 verse 7 that he built an altar. For the first time, Abraham had learned another intelligence that was different from fraternity with family. Before this time, the confidence of Abraham was in the fact that he lived in oneness with his family. He could not understand what God wanted when God said be separated. What God wanted to achieve through Abraham would only be possible on the strength of his intimacy with God. For so long that family was in the line, that level of intimacy that can bear dimensions of God in the extreme was not possible. So God carried him to seek him. When Abraham passed the test of seek him, the only thing Abraham knew to do was the technology of altars. So the Bible said when Abraham left seek him, he built an altar unto the Lord. At this point, he had found a new family. His family had migrated from earth. He had now built another fraternity in the heavens. Did you read in the Bible when the Bible said, we, the family on earth and in heaven. Abraham had found a new league of fraternity. He had come to understand relationship with spirit beings. It was this lifestyle that he began to live that brought him to a point where he was able to separate himself from Lot. And he separated himself from Lot and God appeared again. And in Genesis chapter 3 verse 18, the Bible said he departed to the plains of Mamre and there he built an altar. Altar now became the lifestyle of Abraham. Abraham go, went nowhere unless an altar was built. And every time Abraham departed, he removed his tent, but the altar remains there as an eternal memorial. That was how Abraham secured the boundaries of Bethel. Bethel was not taken over by intelligence. It was taken over by the technology of altars. Abraham littered Bethel with altars. Everywhere Abraham went, he raised an altar. This time around, he had learned how to live apart from his family. You may not know how to live away from masturbation and still have excitement in your soul. So the only thing that gives you pleasure will be masturbation. So you'll be a slave of masturbation for five years. You may not know what pleasure is unless you have a girlfriend that you call every 5 a.m. in the morning and she tells you she loves you until you understand how to service the fire of God in your life. Abraham came to a point in secret and he understood that for him, pleasure was the way of altars. So he began to litter everywhere with altars. And in Genesis chapter 18, from verse 1, the Bible said, Abraham saw men standing in the plains of Mamre. Instantly he knew that these ones are my family members. He didn't need anybody to introduce them. He said, Sars, Sars, come. Instantly he prepared a banquet because these ones, they don't look like the men in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. 
These ones came from heaven. And by altar, he has built a new fraternity. So when he saw them, he knew that these ones are my fathers. These ones are my brothers. He invited them into the house. Immediately, he went and created a banquet. He had known something that could not be taught him within the borderlines of mortality. He learned it in secret. That the only way that the commandment of God can come to pass in his life was to create a new order of lifestyle, the way of orders. Such was the pattern that Abraham created. Because he knew the only way you can leave your family and still have a family is by altars. So his family migrated from earth to heaven. And when men came from heaven, he knew them. You want to leave masturbation? They, so long as that masturbation remains, you will fall down in church ten times. That masturbation will rob you of fire. It will rob you of fire. And when the Holy Ghost wants to break it, it may not be by anointing. You will be praying, Lord, help me. Then God carries you through a circumstance. And as you obey Him and follow, you want to ask for help, you say, no, pray. You go through that circumstance. You want to ask your father. You want to ask your uncle, you say, no, pray. And as you are walking through that circumstance, when you come out on the other side, then you will now ask yourself, when was the last time I masturbated? You had passed through sickness. So the body has been lifted. You have taken upon yourself the body of God. That's how God preserves fire in the life of people. And this is the technology of preserving the fires of revival. Every man that God used to steward the revival must go through the path of separation. It's the teaching syllabus of seeking. And every time they came out, they learned something that had a supernatural foundation. For Abraham, it was the way of all tasks. When Moses, God wanted to birth revival in, in Egypt, he went to a man called Moses. The guy was in the course of Pharaoh as a prince, I told you yesterday. God carried him into the wilderness. And for 40 years, a prince that was served all his life became a shepherd. He was carrying sheep to the, the desert every day and coming back. Do you know how frustrated the guy was? Sometimes he would sit down and say, is this me? When did I get here? God was teaching him. God was teaching him. Because the men he was coming to stir up, they behaved like animals. The only way he could master how to handle Israel was to go and train animals for 40 years. He would think, what's going on here? What am I doing here? They didn't know that he was walking through the chamber of destiny. And when he came out from there, he could carry 3 million people from Egypt that knew nothing. And God would tell him, teach them laws. Teach them ordinances. Teach them statutes. They knew nothing about God because even their patriarchs had no structured system of relating with God. Moses had to come with a new kind of intelligence of training people that were in bondage in a strange land, under strange cultures for 430 years. How do you begin that? Except as he went through the gate of separation. And in Moses' experience, God reduced him to a point of being a shepherd. That was when he gained the skill that was needed to activate a revival. You are hoping that God will use you as a revivalist in your time to set men on fire. You will never escape this job. The process of making of a revivalist. The pathway of seeking. We come to pray and when we leave the prayer meeting we do what we want. We don't understand how spirits work. God will walk, walk himself into you so much. He will chisel your soul until a point come when even when you cough, you cough God. You don't know how you get there. But you have walked with him until nothing else counts. Everything that was important to you, God breaks it off your life. For Paul, God appeared to him in an open encounter. Hope you know that all these men had graphic encounters with God. So encounters don't create revival. It is walking through process that brings about the ability to orchestrate revival. All of them had encounter. Abraham had encounter with God in Mesopotamia. There was no revival. Moses had encounter with God in Horeb. No revival. God walks himself through a man. Paul said when he pleased the father to redeem his son in me, I conferred not with flesh and blood, but I went into Arabia. What do you mean? 
Jesus has been revealed to you. What are you separating yourself to do again? Because process has to come in. And when he came back from Arabia, everywhere he went to and spoke, they said, this one is a God. They said, the gods have come among men. You violate process, you want to become something. You are a joker. We can have many meetings on this campus, but until men are taught how to bend their neck and allow God to walk himself into them, there will never be revival. We can psych ourselves in church, but if we want to see the true texture of our corporate persona, it's when we visit our markets, visit our offices, visit our campuses. That is when we will know whether there is revival in the land. Did you read about John the Baptist? In Luke chapter 1 verse 80, the son of a priest, the Bible said he was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth. You can be walking in the bank, but you'll be in the wilderness. God knows the laws that he will subject your soul to. You may be in the bank and God tells you that in this bank, you will never take bribe. And many times you have problem with your manager, but God is trying to create revival. You will be hated, you will be fought in that bank, but you will follow that law until it's complete. Wilderness is not idleness. It is coming under government until God walks on your soul and purifies you. He said he was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth. Our generation is a generation that runs from process. We come for the fellowship, we look for vacuum, and then we want to take advantage of our natural charisma. Because the guy is a talker. He thinks he's supposed to succeed the next president. God is not looking for talkers. Because she has a good voice. She thinks she's supposed to lead the choir. God is not looking for good voice. If his good voice is looking for, the angelic realm would have sufficed. Have you heard an angel sing before? You will know you are playing here. What makes the difference between your worship and the angelic worship is that in you is the nature of God. So every time you lift your voice in worship, you are releasing incense that is the nature and the essence of God. And a man who God has not purified cannot release virtue. He cannot release the nature of God. We teach men to bring their shoulders so that God can put his body. That's when there's hope for a generation. What burden are you carrying for the Lord? You cannot trigger a revival. You can never trigger a revival. You are smart with God. God comes this way, you go this way. God comes this way, you go this way. He will always give you bread and water, but you will never be relevant with Him. When you go to eternity, then you will discover that the reason you came into the world was to bet a process, but you never created it. Everything about John had one definition, to make the way for the Lord. What if he went back to eternity and he never did it? But how did John get to know it? It was in the pathway of process. He said, the one that appeared to me the same said unto me, Upon whomever the Spirit descends and rests is the Messiah. So John did not come baptizing because the, the Pharisees were sprinkling water on people. They called him John the Baptist because it was a new strategy, never existed. And the quality of his work was not the way it was because it was novel. It was the way it was because it was by instruction. It was by commandment. The reason he was baptizing was because it was a strategy of identifying Jesus. So he didn't come to do it because everybody is doing it. That was the only way he could recognize the Messiah. He walked in this thing until even his own eyes became open. When he saw Jesus, before baptism he knew him. What we call growth is strange. We call growth the number of cars we have. Then spirits will come and they will be wondering. This guy is a prophet. He has not scratched one tenth of his prophetic calling. And he says he's made. The angels that work with you will stand like this. This guy is supposed to be a governor. 
Look at him selling clothes in a bar. He has not even noticed that this thing is on his life. Then the angels will look at you and shake their head. And then you go for a meeting, you do like this. And they say, who are you? They say, my name is Nathaniel. I'm studying biochemistry. I'm in 300 level. <laughs> they said to John, who are you? John invoked a prophecy that lasted for 700 years. Who told him he was the one? He said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. I am the voice. I am the voice. Who are you? Do you know the implication of saying you are the voice? If you say you are the voice, then they will say, where is the desire? Because the job description of the voice is to identify the desire. Even that one, he said, the one that sent me, the same said unto me, upon whomever the spirit descends. See how men walked on earth. See how men walked with God. And then you are living by trial and error. And you think you will be relevant. These were men without the Holy Spirit. See the degree of accuracy with which they walked. The girl is singing in church. She thought it's about position. So when they say new, there's a program. That's when she buys new high heat. Where's new we go? And she sings it. She's doing like this. And then she carries a very high pitch. <laughs> ah! Meanwhile, like I always say, inside that girl's voice, there is something God planted. So that every time she lifts her voice to heaven, the angels that activate the gifts of the Spirit begin to walk. So every time that girl sings, a prophet is supposed to arise. A healing evangelist is supposed to arise. But she has been singing in church for 20 years. Not one gift has been activated. Because she thought it was about skill. So she sings the song, she tweaks it, she tweaks it. She bends her voice. She does the tongue and they say, oh boy. Ha! Sarah, you gave voice. They say, it's the grace of God. Meanwhile, every time she carries the microphone, all the angels are at last. They are waiting for her to touch him so that they can begin to walk. But those angels have stood for 20 years. None of them have walked. Now, even when she's singing, they are relaxing. They know she can't touch him. The day revival begins. That day she may lose her voice because she was praying in tongue for 10 hours. But she comes to church as she said, Hallelujah. People begin to see in the spirit. People begin to see. People's hand, oil begins to flow. That day she has come alive in Zion. Hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. 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 That day nobody may be excited, but somebody will leave that meeting. And then the person goes to the hostel and they say, Nathaniel is sick. And then suddenly faith moves in his spirit and says, Be healed. That faith that was stirred in his spirit, it was the voice of that girl that activated that faith because she had come alive. The guys enter the family. In their family for the past nine years, every two years, somebody dies. And today, for the first time, he enters the house. And then he just feels there is something by the door. He has never had that perception. But she attended this meeting where this girl was feeling. And his spiritual senses was activated. And he goes to the house. And then he shuts the voice of that altar. And death ends. Because a girl discovers her potential to the spirit. At every time she sings. She activates gifts. So for that girl, when she's coming for the crusade, others may be making their head. There's nothing wrong with it. She can make hers. But before she comes to that microphone, she will make sure that her spirit is saturated with the Holy Ghost. Even though she has a good voice, she understands that in the scales of the sanctuary, her value is not rated on the texture of her voice. Her value is now rated to the degree to which she can download it. So she will pray in tongues for five hours before she holds the microphone. She has understood priorities. Such people, their name echo in heaven as popular citizens of Zion. Men walking on earth, but fulfilling purposes that were born in the heights of the heavens. Jesus said, He is come to do the will of the Father. 
So when you see Jesus, you see the Father. Jesus came to reveal God to humankind. Why are you here? Everything you pursue is legitimate. But it will not count unless you find out what God wants you to do. Because the day every one of us realize what we are born to do and begin to do it, that day the move of God begins. That's why God stares men up. Yours may be prayer. You think it's just to hide somewhere and pray. <laughs> that prayer you are praying is generating energy for something else to happen on the altar. Yours may be business. You are skilled for business. So you wake up, every, anything you touch begins to prosper. People can't see the business opportunity, you see it. And then you make all kinds of money. And when the church wants to go to TV and you are the one that sponsors it, you may not be praying, but what God put in your heart is the skill for business. Yours may be intelligent. You are in the lab 24 hours, discovering the survivor. Yours may be on the political corridor. You know how to manipulate power. So you are the one that will pack the B that the church should become an institution. Reviver. This is not puppet we are talking about. This is the move of God. Because men have gone through the pathway of process and they have discovered who they were. When God appeared to me and told me he would make me an apostle to the nations, I was 12 years old. I thought that would happen the next day. <laughs> My training process took more than 13 years. The last, the last one that happened to me, sir, my friend, we were living together in the same house. We were in a two-bedroom apartment. He had one bedroom, I had another bedroom. Both of us were sons of Apostle Romeo, sir. A very good man. Till today, if I would point at somebody and say, this is my elder brother, he's the one. He was the one God used to chisel me. This guy runs a campus church. And when God began to separate me, I started going on periodic fast, 21 days fast, 21 days fast. I was running the schedule until I hit somewhere in the spirit. And then I saw him in a vision. And the word of wisdom that spoke to me in that vision was for me to join myself to him. So I came to his church. Before then, I was attending another church. I came to his church. After the first Sunday, second Sunday, I now walked to him and said, well, I think anything that you would have me do, I can just be here and serve. Both of us ministers in remnant. Both of us friends. Both of us living in the same house. You know what this guy did to me? The guy carried me by the hand like this and took me to the ushering unit and said, I should join the ushering unit. Me and you are ministers in remnant. We are friends. We are living in the same house. He said, I should join. And then he looked at me and said, Yeah, here, he likes people to grow through the ladder. Grow through his ladder. Me and you are starting up for far You are saying as you grow through the ladder in the campus church. I had my master's degree. This guy was still a student. I came to church. And then I only wore suits. Double breasted suits. And we come to church. And we stand like this. They will now say, hey, brother, come. I, I, then I will realize I was the one. And I will run and collect the offering basket. As I'm giving the offering basket, I'm in another world. Is this me? What's happening here? I don't know where to put my face. And then the worst part, they will have program and invite ministers or eminence who are my colleagues. And then when they come, see the way this guy is standing, I will stand like this. That was in 2017. <laughs> that was when I understood that there was a place that is deeper than doctrine. You think you are humble, you think you are broken, you think God wants to use you, you are a joker. I did that thing for one year, eight months. That was when God now touched his heart. Then I will come to church. Then I should sit with him in front. I wanted to say no. What do you mean sit between the front? After you have humiliated me, you now say, I would have failed the test again. As I wanted to utter it, the Holy Ghost moved in my soul. And I respected myself quickly. But a point came. As I did that thing for like six months, it became normal. I will be serving, I won't even notice how many. Sometimes they will organize a meeting, I will go and preach. Some of his brethren will attend. The power of God will scatter everywhere. They will come to church, they will say, sir, sir, sir. They will be so, is this you? Is you? 
Sometimes they will meet me, they meet me and say, Sir, we didn't know, we didn't know. Some people that you are giving them bellows, you also know. You know how rude and arrogant students are. <laughs> One year, six months, God was purifying my soul. And it was my brother he used. This is a very good man. Loving and humble personality. But God moved in his heart. He said, put him in the ocean unit. I was there for one year, six months. Somebody says, seek him. It's called seek him. They teach him some body. They deal him some God. That's what creates fire. Eternal and everlasting in your soul. The pathway of process. That God brings you into in order to destroy the effect of the fall in your soul. Those places where the devil will come and place demand, God destroys that foundation. So when the devil comes, there is nothing to hold on to. So Jesus said, the prince of this world come to me and find it nothing. You know why? He went to John to be baptized. He said, suffer it to be so for now. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. How can creator go to be baptized of creation? Humiliation. You will call it. But God was teaching humankind the way to power, the way to spiritual authority, the way to move in the hand of God was for a man to come down and submit to the government of God. This is why we cry in church, God genuinely touch us. We fall under the anointing. But nothing about God lasts in our lives because the stability that God wants to create in our soul through process and dealing with violated. So God wants to do something, pride we approach it. God wants to do something, lies we approach it. God wants to do something, masturbation we approach it. We keep crying periodically, but no results. It's because we violate the protocol of deal. Sikkim is a path that everyone follows. He said in Isaiah 51 verse 1 to 3, He said, hearken unto me, all ye that love righteousness, all ye that were hewn from the people. He said, look unto Abraham your father. And unto Sarah that bore thee, for I have called thee alone and blessed thee. I have called him alone and blessed him and increased him. The path that Abraham followed is the path that all of us will follow. That is why even Jesus, the Son of God, when he came, he followed that path. The Holy Ghost drove him through pathways of dealing until the Bible said he learned obedience through the things he suffered. Your title will become nothing unless you subscribe to the school called Sikkim in the spirit. Where God places legitimate burdens on your shoulder so that he can chisel himself into your soul. Your prayer will have no power unless you have known the way of Sikkim. That's how God makes warriors. I told you, the idea is not just to create revival. The idea is to raise a clan of revivalists. And if we must be a clan of revivalists, all of us must pass through the pathway of TV. That's where your addictions will break. That's where your fears will break. That's where the hand of the devil upon your life will break. Nobody manifests overnight. I went through that school many times. And when God graduated me from there, he came to me and said, I will begin to announce you. And I released my messages. And in 14 days, my messages were in 17 nations. 17 nations of the world. In 14 days, I received four invitations in the U.S. What was I saying? It's the same thing I was saying for 13 years. But after process was complete, God now released the angels and they began to blow their shofar in the spirit. So when you say Jesus is Lord, people hear it and it echoes into their heart. Because your soul has become a conduit pipe that can steward the dimensions of God. Paul said, for that we loved you, we have not only communicated the gospel, but the substance of our soul. Hope you know when the leprous guys were going, their steps became like the sound of a chariot. When God deals with a man and he is refined, if that man speaks, the angels that walk with him echo it. They echo it through the earth. Did you read about Jesus? After he left the mountain of temptation, the Bible said his fame went abroad. That's why John could speak from the wilderness and the whole nation will go to him. There was a mystery in the spirit that was amplifying his voice. And every time he spoke, the angels gave it a thousand voice. So one man speaks, it becomes like the voice of many waters. 
you will carry the biggest speakers in your conference. And you will scream and speak in tongues and shout. Your message will remain on the shelf. Nobody will download it. Even if you pay and go to TBM. Apostles say the day you come and say hallelujah, nobody will tune in. Have you not noticed? Everybody's message is on Telegram now. Everybody is, on, is a Facebook apostle. Everybody is a Facebook evangelist. It is God that announces them. And until you yield to God, until he chisels you, your soul cannot conduct his dimensions. Tonight, we are going to first of all make a commitment to God. Before we pray for the fire of God to rest on people. It's a very easy thing to release the fire of God. But it takes a lot of time to manage it. In Leviticus chapter 6 verse 12, he said the fire on the altar must not be put out. They put every morning. We can lift the song now and release fire. We can begin to pray and release fire. We can just start talking and allow our soul to ascend and release fire. But it will take a lifetime to, to steward it. And this is why I came to show you something. I came to reveal to you this evening that the path of dealing, the path of yieldedness, the path of obedience is the only channel through which God raises a revivalist. Paul said something. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, he said, We are servants of God, therefore we are stewards of the mysteries of Christ. That means access to mystery is not a function of study. You study to show yourself approved, but to gain access to mystery, you must become a servant of Christ. A part of dealing. Many of us live for ourselves. If we take a census, you'll be shocked that there are some people here that the Holy Ghost have been troubling for the past three months to pray every night. But because the authority of God is not, is not in their consciousness, they waste all their energy in the daytime. And when they go to sleep, they lie down like this and wake up by 9 a.m. And they say, it's not my fault. I wanted to wake up. If, if that consciousness is created, in the daytime, you know how to manage your energy. There are some people here that God has been instructing to take a fast, to take a fast, but the consciousness is not there. They think fasting is a spiritual exercise. They think it's a religious practice. You don't know that your destiny and your relevance in this world will anchor on the instruction that God gives you. For Noah, he said, build an ark. For Abraham, he said, get thee out of thy father's house. For Moses, he said, go to Pharaoh. If they had violated any of these instructions, they would never have been relevant. That instruction you think is a religious activity, that may be the only thing that will define your destiny. To give their testimonies from their houses by the power of the Holy Ghost. Oh my God. I love it when God wants to do us good. You just open up and you allow Jesus to flow through you. It's an amazing thing. It's a testament of the love of God. It's a revelation of the nature of God. His desire to bless us beyond all that we deserve. You know, if God were to give you what you deserve, wow, wow, it would be a terrible day. But thanks be to God for His mercies. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us according to His mercy and His love. And that is why we receive the best. That is why we know we deserve the best. Because we don't receive what we earn. We receive what Jesus paid for. Someone is happy tonight. Can you give the Lord a bigger shout of praise? Woohoo! Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to show you some things very quickly before we begin the midday, the miracle session. You know, demons. I told you are intelligent beings. The strength of demonic oppression is in your area of ignorance. Any area where you lack understanding is an area where devils have liberty. The moment knowledge and understanding comes to you, the devil is checked out instantly because the devil knows that he has lost his authority of dominion over you. So he, he trades and he reigns 
in areas of ignorance. That's why the devil will not allow you to pray. Because he knows if you pray, the Holy Ghost will talk to you. That's why the devil will not allow you to study the word of God. Because he knows when you study the word of God, you will discover who you are in God. That's why the devil will not allow you to go for the meetings where the revelation of God's word will be unveiled. Because he knows the day you discover, that day he loses to be the master over your life. But tonight, I'm going to be bringing you the word of the Lord. And it's not going to deliver you just from sicknesses. It's going to deliver most of you from depression. It's going to deliver you from a sense of guilt. Because the devil have kept you in a tight corner for too long. The devil have made you think that God is not happy with you. The devil has made you think that God is angry with you. The devil has made you think you are good for nothing. Because every day he comes, he reminds you that time where you committed immorality. He reminds you that time where you lied. He reminds you that time when you stole. But brother, there is something the Holy Ghost reminds us about. He reminds us about the sacrifice of Jesus. He reminds us about the blood of the Lamb. He reminds us about the love of God. He reminds us about the message of God. Because your sin is not the only thing on the slate. There is something God put on the slate. There is the blood of Jesus on the slate. And the moment the blood of Jesus came on the slate something happened. He said he blotted out every handwriting of ordinance against you. He blotted out every testimony of darkness against you. He blotted out every sin you ever committed. Why? Because the price was paid. You need to understand that God has done something. It is called the gospel. You need to understand that your crisis is not your only reality. There's a reality you have in God on the strength of what Jesus has done. That is the gospel. And I've come to share the gospel with you tonight, somebody. The gospel of Jesus. Romans 1.17 The Bible said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. When a man is in bondage, that man has not heard the gospel. If you are in crisis, you have not heard the gospel. You don't need to do anything to be delivered. All you need is to believe. The Bible said in Colossians chapter 3 from verse 1 to 4, it said, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? It said you began in the spirit. You want to be made manifest. You want to be made perfect in the flesh? Is it him that walketh miracles among you? Do it by the law or by the hearing of faith. If you can only believe, there will be a performance. The angel came to Mary. He said, I know you are a virgin, but you are going to be with child by the power of the Holy Ghost. There is not going to be a sexual intercourse. You don't need to know a man. It has never happened before, but it doesn't matter. Because what will make the difference is the power of the Holy Ghost. How do you get there? Only believe. Can you believe tonight? Your captivity will be over. The systems of the world are designed to teach you how to live in fear. That's why they tell you the stories about the people that died of cancer. They tell you the stories about the thousands that died of hepatitis. They don't tell you the ones God healed. The systems of the world, they are designed to keep you in fear. They are designed to keep you in captivity. But if you turn to the Lord and you can see the light of the gospel, something will change forever in your life. Tonight, people will not just be healed, but people that came here sick will go with the healing anointing. And they will begin to heal others by the Spirit of God. Hey, you don't know what will happen. What I'm doing now, I'm trying, I'm putting. I'm putting, I'm putting. My soul is about to fly. I'm putting. Hey. And I just want to be where you are. Dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near to where you are. I just want to be where you are. In your dwelling place forever. Take me to the place. Where you are I just want to be with you 
who loves Jesus here? Just wave. <laughs> look at that. Is the devil not a loser already? Come on, look at the people that love Jesus. Look at that. Look at that. In your presence. Coming here to where you are I want to be where you are Dwelling in your presence Feasting at your table Surrounded by your glory In your presence That's where I always want to be I just want to be I just want to be with you John chapter 10 verse 10 The Bible said the devil cometh not but for to kill To steal and to destroy The manifesto of the devil was made bare you know, Jesus needed to tell us the agenda of the devil. Because it's, it's possible for you to be deceived and beguiled by the devil. You know, the Bible said, the devil beguiled Eve. The voice of Satan is sweet. The strategy of the devil is slippery. It sustains the capacity to lure. It sustains the capacity to beguile. So Jesus needed in clear terms to tell you the agenda of darkness. He said, the devil cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He said, but I am. My visit to the earth is a contrast of everything the devil is doing. He said, I am come to give you life and life in abundance. If you are not aware, you may fraternize with darkness thinking there is a future. Have you been to that spot before where the devil tries to debate with you or bait something for another and then you think what you are receiving or what you are given rather is small compared to what you are receiving. The devil doesn't have a gift. Everything he has is called death. The Bible said in Acts of the Apostles chapter 10 verse 38 it said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good delivering all that were oppressed of the devil sickness is an oppression of the devil the devil will oppress you with sickness and still come to tell you that it's your fault he will oppress you with sickness and still come to tell you there is no deliverance for you he will want you to know that you will not be healed because of what you did yesterday Jesus saw what you did did you remember that in scriptures nobody was saved in the days of Jesus because salvation was only possible by the Holy Spirit but everybody Jesus healed were sinners so the healing power of God is not obstructed by sin the healing power of God is not reduced by sin because Jesus healed the sinners and did you see and study your Bible that Jesus never asked anybody why he was sick he didn't care whether it was your ancestors that did something he didn't care whether it was your sin that did something all he was interested in was to do good because the anointing upon his life came to do you good so brothers and sisters that story the devil is telling you just expired a moment ago because your sin cannot stop you from the healing power of God the reason you put away your sin is because you have understood the love of God the reason you put away your sins is because you have become a reasonable Christian you have seen the sacrifice that Jesus paid for you so it is no longer reasonable for you to continue in sin you want to taste of the love of God so your sin is not a hindrance to your healing you are the one thinking it's a hindrance because the devil sold that idea to you can you tell somebody you are a candidate of divine health how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power did you notice that it was not the sick people that were running after him the Bible said he went about he went about Jesus is more interested in healing you that you are than you are interested in receiving healing 
Because some of you think you need to do something to receive healing. Jesus doesn't care what you need to do. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about the Madarin maniac, the Gadarin maniac. He was on another side of the sea, mad and locked in the tomb. Jesus finished a crusade. He was supposed to be tired that evening, but he did something. He had to cross over the river because there was a sick man on the other side of the tomb. He finished the crusade. He was tired. He was exhausted. He had every right to rest, but because of what was troubling him, he could not sleep because there was somebody sleeping in the grave. He had to go across the borders and he healed the Gadarin maniac and he turned back immediately. So the reason Jesus took the stress of crossing the sea was not because he wanted to visit the city there was one man sick because of one man God can travel from Lagos to Edo State because of one man's sickness the Holy Spirit can leave Makodi and come to Edo State he passes by your city tonight are you going to receive it's your choice how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power can you ask the Lord for healing tonight all you need to do is to ask, brother. He said, ask, you shall receive. Seek, you shall find. Knock, the door shall be opened unto you. He didn't say repent and be healed. He said, ask and you shall receive. Is it important to repent? Yes, because God cannot walk with a sinner. But receiving the bounties and the goodness of God is not a function of repentance. That was why salvation did not come to you before you repented. Salvation came to you and you began to repent after you got saved. You now understood that you are walking with God now so you cannot continue the old way. Are you listening to me, somebody? There is a free ticket of healing tonight for anybody who can believe, for anybody who will wish to receive. I want to share with you something this evening. I call it spiritual insurance. There is something God has put in stock for you perpetually to walk in dominion in this life. It's a spiritual insurance. When you work with a company, they have, they have packets, packages. There are packages for your healing. In a company, they will put what they call medical package, health package. If the secular system understands much, how much more your heavenly father? There are packages that God has put in place for your perpetual walk in freedom and in liberty. One of them is called the sacrifice on the cross. The cross. So long as the cross remains in eternity, there is an insurance for you. I want to tell you the implication of the cross. You know, most people carry the crucifix. They don't even know what it means. It has become a religious thing. The cross is beyond a religious, a religious show of a crucifix. The sign of the cross is not a... <laughs> The cross. The cross. What is the implication of the cross? The first thing the cross stands for is that the cross is the great divide. The cross is the statement that God made that it was possible for life to begin from death. The cross is the journey from death to life. The cross is the point where God deals with the old creation so that the newness of the new creation can emanate. Anybody that have journeyed through the cross have no judgment on his shoulders anymore. Because the judgment that God has on the sinner is on the cross. That is why if you don't accept Jesus, you will be judged. If you have accepted Jesus, every judgment that is meant for you is already on Jesus on the cross. Any man who has passed through the cross in the economy of the Father is already dead. So God cannot see his sins. God cannot see his iniquity. When God looks at the old man, the old man was crucified. The old man was dead. The person God looks at now is the new man that resurrected in Christ Jesus. And that man is perfect. It's called the cross. The cross is an insurance policy. That is the policy that deals with guilt. That is the policy that deals with depression. Yes, when you come out of the cross in the eyes of the Father, you are perfect. That's why you don't approach the Father in the name of Simon. You don't approach the Father in the name of Matthew. You approach the Father in the name of Jesus. Because anybody that comes out of the cross has one habitat. It's in Christ. That one is in Christ. That one is in Christ. Because he has journeyed to the cross. The cross is the divide between the old man and the new man. The cross is where the judgment and the anchor of God was, was placed. You know, when you see now, sometimes God will want to kill you because the wages of sin is death. But when you sin and God wants to kill you, 
that death he has already put it on Jesus because God saw the sin you will see tomorrow so all the anger he had in his mind he has already killed you in Christ it's called the cross it's a technology that transcends time and space you know if the cross cannot deal with your future sin you couldn't be born again because you and I died after Jesus resurrected and the sins we sin if we confess Jesus today it is forgiven by what technology is it forgiven it's called the cross every time you fall and God wants to hit you that punch he wants to give you he gave it already 2,000 years ago you are the one who is manifesting it now but the father has already afflicted you the father has already dealt with you that's why he said he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes we were healed he didn't say we are healed he said we were healed God knew you will be sick tomorrow. That is why he put the ceiling on the cross. God knew you will sin tomorrow. That is why he put the forgiveness on the cross. God knew you were going to fall tomorrow. That's why the forgiveness is on the cross. So every time Satan shows up and say, hey sinner, look at Satan and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He will say, but you sinned yesterday. You say, no, no, no. Satan, look at the cross of Jesus. Jesus hung on the cross. I was there with him. I was there. I was included. It's called the economy of the cross. It is your perpetual insurance. Your perpetual. Listen, I thought about consecration yesterday. I thought about priesthood yesterday. I know the place of kingdom responsibility. But I'm telling you what you need to know so that you can never be a slave of the devil. It's called the cross. Is it that you died with him? That you died. You don't have a life anymore. That's why Paul said in Galatians 2.20, he said the life that I live now in the flesh It is the life of the son of God Who died for me It is called the journey of faith Every time I walk I walk with my shoulders high Because I know the accuser of the brethren Can't come near I understand that the cross paid the price My mistakes They hung on the cross My accusation They hung on the cross My judgment It hung on the cross Will that give me a license to continue in sin? No, because I was not the one hanging on the cross. It was somebody else that died for my pain. It was somebody else that died for my sickness. So every time I want to live my life, I will live with an understanding that the sorrows that should come to me, somebody else bore it. So my life becomes a perpetual gratitude to Jesus. So the cross is not a license for sin. The cross is a revelation of gratitude. I sinned. They were supposed to shoot me. And then my brother shows up and says, I am Michael. And then they killed him. Everything I'm supposed to, he is supposed to do while he's alive, I will do it for him. That's why Paul said, be a reasonable Christian. You will not be forced, but it behoves you to be reasonable. He had a family. He had a life. But he died for you. What do you do? You become a reasonable Christian. So everything Jesus would have loved, everything Jesus would have done, I will do it in this life. So when you look at me, you see Jesus. Because I'm living for Jesus. It's called the technology of the cross. The cross is where the power of Satan was taken away. You know, Satan is the God of this world. Because when Adam fell, he gave him authority over this world. Satan became the ruler over this world. So everybody that is under disobedience, according to Ephesians 2 verse 2, is the son of Satan. But in the cross, something happened. We died. So we disappeared from the radar of Satan. When he looks for me, he will not find me anymore. You know why? Because I died. He can't find me. If somebody dies, what happens? He goes six feet below. You check him in the registers on the earth, you won't find him. He is deleted from the world. When I entered the cross with Jesus, I vanished from the radar of Satan. And every power Satan has over me, something happened. The Bible said he spoiled principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in victory. Where was that done? On the cross. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. This is why we have assurance. We don't have assurance because we fast and pray. We have assurance because the price was paid by Jesus. The cross is the system of kingdom insurance the cross every time I go to God to demand something I don't come kneeling and say Lord look at me a humble sinner no way thank you father 
because I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you because the price was paid. I come boldly before the throne of grace. Paul said, come boldly. Ah, no, no, no. On the account of the cross, I have become the child of God. When God looks at me, he looks at Jesus because I have no life anymore. I only appear in Christ. Imagine if you were going to ask your father for breakfast and then you need and say, Daddy, please, can we have breakfast? You don't know what a child is. You don't understand the love of the father. If you know your father loves you, he will come on and say, Come on, Dad, there's no food in this house. Why is there no food in this house? Mama, I need to eat because I'm hungry. Why? You have become a son. And as a son, you have legitimate right to the things of the kingdom. Healing is not something we beg for, we command it. He said, Healing is the children's bread. We command it. See, when you see a preacher operating, he's not operating the way he's operating because he's a preacher. When I begin to minister to the sick here, I'm not going to come and say, Lord, please heal them. No way. I will look at you and say, be healed. You know why? I command it. When you understand it, if sickness comes to you, you say, Satan, where are you coming from? Come on, pain. Get out of my body. Pain, get out. Satan can't even cough around you because he knows you have understanding. You have understanding. The cross is where Jesus took the shame. In, in Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5 to 9, the Bible said he was God. But he didn't count it robbery to share his equality with God. He stripped himself of the garment of divinity. You don't know what the cross is. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. When we talk about the sacrifice of the cross, many don't understand it. They don't understand it. The cross is where the greatest revelation of the love of God was displayed. You don't understand. Do you know what it means? Maybe they now call my brother here and say there is a crisis in the pig kingdom. You need to become a pig. And then you go into the pig kingdom and you suffer the life of pigs. You will live in, in mud. You will eat feces. You will become a pig and then you will die as a pig so that every pig can be justified. And you know the problem? You will never be a man anymore. Even if you come in our midst, you will remain a pig forever. Right now in heaven, Jesus cannot appear as a God. In heaven, he is still a man. Why? He descended to the level of creation because he needed to deliver you. Do you know what it means if you look into an aquarium and they say this fish needs to deliver other fish? Or they tell you, son, become a fish and then you enter the aquarium because you want to deliver the fishes. And then when the fish are delivered, you can never be a man anymore. You always remain a fish. It's the power of the cross. That's why it was sufficient to pay for your sins. Is it good to continue in sin? Paul said, God forbid. But we know we cannot be tied in bondage. When we look at what Jesus did, we break out with thanksgiving. It takes love to do that. It takes love. I'm sure of the love of God for my life. I'm sure about it. I don't need anybody to tell me God loves you. Because I understand the sacrifice on the cross. I have confidence in the love of God. That's why if I sin, I don't run away from God. I run to God. God gave David three options. Either to be slain by his enemies for three years. Or to suffer plagues for seven years. Or to come to God and allow God to deal with him. He said, God, you better deal with him. Because in God, there is plenty of redemption. When you sin, you don't run away from God. You run to God. That's where your hope is. Because on the cross, he demonstrated the highest level of love. The cross is the greatest mystery of all, of all existence. There are four absolutes that you can never contradict. Two of them particularly because of what I'm teaching is justice and mercy. What mercy demands is that whatever the case is, just let go. But what justice demands is that the penalty for every offense must be paid. So if God wants to display mercy, it will be at the expense of justice. If God wants to display justice, it will be at the expense of mercy. But because his nature is a just nature and at the same time a merciful nature, he cannot choose one against the other. On the cross, God was able through divine intelligence to demonstrate both justice and mercy at the same time. The price of sin was completely paid for and the penalty of death was levied. 
and then the mercy of God was completely paid for because every sinner was exonerated. How was that possible? Is the mystery of the cross. Because God himself took the penalty so that you who is a sinner can be let go. So mercy was demonstrated in the highest feet and then justice was demonstrated in the highest feet. It's called the mystery of the cross. That's why on the cross every principality was disarmed. That was where the devil was shamed. Because the devil sinned in heaven. There was no way he could be redeemed. So when the devil deceived man and man fell, the devil thought man too was doomed. You don't know what happened in heaven before you were created. There was actually a boast. Oh, let me tell you a, a, a quick story in eternity past. What gave God pleasure in eternity past was Lucifer. Lucifer was the reflection of the greatest beauties in all of the creation of God. If God wanted to derive pleasure, what he needed to do was Lucifer to come on the display. Oh, you need to study about the credentials of Lucifer. I did a teaching on the seven credentials of Lucifer to teach you the, the dangers of pride. I did a teaching. You need to know who Lucifer was. Aish. The Bible called him the son of the morning. The Bible called him Thou that sealed the sun. What it means is that Lucifer was brighter than the sun in glory. If Lucifer shows up like this, you don't need the sun. The sun will go dim. That was the glory that the man, the being carried. It was a reflector of light in the heights of the heavens. Lucifer was the one that conducted the worship in heaven. The Bible said, From the day of thy creation, thy types and thy tablets were indeed. So if God needs to be happy, Lucifer just needs to show up. He will do like this. Heaven will be full of joy. He understood the mood of God. He could create the mood of heaven. Every time anything needs to happen in heaven, sound is the one that conducts it. And Lucifer was the governor of sounds. He was called the anointed cherub. That means he was the only one that God was smeared upon. So he could relate with God intimately. He knew the mind of God. He was called the merchandise of beauty and wisdom full of glory. But when pride entered, he, he fell from glory. He fell. Even God himself lamented. He said, oh Lucifer, how art thou fallen? Oh, do you know when a creator begins to wave? A creator is one that can just say, come and speak and something else will happen. But when Lucifer fell, that was a big loss. Oh Lucifer, how art thou fallen? So God now decided, because Lucifer feels he was proud, God now decided to create another being to replace him. That being will become his object of love. And this time around, the glory of the being God wanted to create will not be in the outside. It will be on the inside. Because Lucifer was covered with ten precious stones. The Bible said he was clothed with diamond. He was clothed with sapphire. He was clothed with topaz. He was clothed with kabunku. He was clothed with ten precious stones. So, when he shows up, you see beauty and glory. So, God said, no. I will create another being that will be better than you. And this one, I will not use stones to decorate him. I will use my spirit to decorate him. But he will be on his inside. That was when God embarked on the creation of man. So man became the pride of God. Man became the revelation of God's intelligence. Man became the reflection of God's architectural masterpiece. And man became the thing that gave God pleasure. Did you remember the first time Jesus showed up? That was the first time the perfect man appeared on heaven, on earth. And God said, this is my beloved son. In whom... I am well pleased. The first time God was pleased in creation after the fall of Lucifer was when Jesus showed up. The reason is because Adam would have been the man that God was well pleased in. But Lucifer truncated the process. He caused that man to, to fall so that the man would be doomed like him. But God came back in Jesus Christ and restored the human race so that he will still be pleased in man. That possibility only exists in the cross. Lucifer knew you were his replacement. Everything he stood for, the glories of Lucifer, the beauty of Lucifer, everything God gave you a thousand times more. So Lucifer will fight you from shining. He will fight you from walking in glory. Did you notice the Bible said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You were created for glory because you were the replacement of Lucifer. That's why in your system there are sounds. Do you notice? Let me not go there. I will, I will get lost. Lucifer knew that you were the beauty of creation. So he wanted to destroy you. But on the cross, every attempt of Lucifer 
was futile. The Bible said that the princes of this world had known. Because when Jesus showed up, the guy knew the day the Son of God appears. That day his dominion will end. So he went and looked at him. He began to fight him. He said, are you the Son of God? Because everybody that shows up, he strikes. When Noah showed up, he struck him. Abraham showed up, Taka. Moses showed up, Taka. Anybody that comes to a point to demonstrate a feat as if he was the Son of God, he will fight until Jesus showed up. For Moses, he caught up with him in anger. And he found something for everybody. For Samson, he caught up with him in immorality. But when Jesus came, he came and he didn't find anything. He said, The prince of this world come to me and find that nothing. And that was why Jesus paid the price for you and I to become the glory of God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he said, Man is the glory of God. The revelation of God's essence is called man. But all of that possibility is on the cross. The next time the devil comes to deceive you, tell the devil, can you check the document about the cross? When you finish reading it and understand, come back. It's obvious you don't understand the chapter in which the mystery of the cross was written. Go and study it. When you understand what it means, come back. Because this man you are talking to understands the cross. It is called the system of spiritual insurance. The second infrastructure we have for our insurance is called the blood. I want to come down to share these things with you so that it will, it will echo in your mind for a long time. Even if you don't know the doctrine, let it be in your mind that because of the cross you can't be condemned. In Romans chapter 8 verse 1, it says, for now there is no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the law of the flesh, but after the law of the spirit. When you understand it and your life is controlled by it, you are invincible. The devil can't fight you. That's why the Bible said, concerning the believer, it says, as the wind bloweth, and thou listest not from where it's coming or where it goes. He said, so are they that are born of the spirit of God. Your life is a proof that there is life after death. That's why we are confident about, immor confident about immor immortality. You are a proof that there is life after death because you were born from the cross. Next time they ask you about your genealogy, don't go back to your great grandfather, go to the cross. Some people will come and tell you, they say, oh, your ancestors buried 10 virgins. And because of the virgins they buried, everybody in your lineage is cursed, not me. I didn't come from that lineage. My genealogy is God the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, Abraham and me. God the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, Abraham, Jesus and... Because Jesus is the seed of Abraham and all of us emanate from him. It's the system of the cross. That's why I can't be cursed. I don't care all those their doctrine. They will go and explain it. They will talk about spiritual pattern. That's why a lot of people cannot be healed. You don't know the price Jesus paid. That thing affects even your flesh. He said we are now one flesh, one blood and one bone. It is the system of the cross. I can't be condemned. This is organic reality. Do Christians still commit sin? Do they still fall? Do they still make mistakes? Yes. Because all of us are a work in progress. But sin will no longer have dominion over us. Every time the devil gets us, we rise again. And we call God for mercy. And we receive grace to move forward. Because the righteous man falleth seven times. And seven times he rises again. We will never lie down and make sin a practice or a lifestyle. It's the system of the cross. We understand that we are delivered. The second infrastructure is called the blood. The blood is the silencer of the, accu of the accuser of the brethren. You know, the devil is a rebellious spirit. The devil knows you are called. He will come to you and say, are you sure you are called? Did you study about Jesus in Matthew chapter 4? Jesus that was the direct incarnate of God. He will come and say, if you are the son of God. What do you mean? <laughs> do you know who you are talking to? <laughs> if you are the son of God, you know I'm the son of God. Why are you asking? So the devil will come and tell you, are you sure God is happy with you? Why would God be happy with me? <laughs> Why 
why won't God be happy with me? He said, whoever is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away. All things have become new. Everything about me is Christ. Why won't God be happy with me? The blood of Jesus is the silencer of the accuser of the brethren. But you need to have the revelation to walk in it. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, he said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. When you understand this revelation and you walk in it, and it impacts your life, and it becomes your operating system. You know, I see a lot of people come and say, I sprinkle the blood. I sprinkle. You, you are not the one to sprinkle the blood, Oga. Where is the blood you are sprinkling? They make religion out of hollow things. You don't sprinkle the blood. It's only the high priest that, that have access to the blood. And it's the high priest that sprinkles the blood. And Jesus is our high priest. <laughs> so it's Jesus that sprinkles the blood for you. If you want to sprinkle the blood, you are dead. You know why? Between the time you fell and the time you are sprinkling the blood, what will happen to you? <laughs> it's when the attack came that you are sprinkling the blood. You would have been buried by that time if the blood was not sprinkled. I sprinkle the blood of Jesus. I sprinkle the blood of Jesus. No, 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 no. When the devil attacks, stand up and say, The blood speaks on my behalf. Hey. For the blood is speaking. Because the high priest, when he ascended from the grave, Mary Magdalene came to touch me, saying, No, touch me not. I have not appeared before the Father. And when he appeared, the Bible said, He entered the Holy of Holies in the heights of the heavens and he sprinkled the blood on your account. So the blood is speaking for you perpetually. So I don't need to say I sprinkle the blood before the magic happens. When I show up, I know the blood is already being sprinkled. Because if I walk in the light, if I walk in the revelation, if I walk in the understanding, then the blood is already walking. Jesus is the administrator of the blood. And the blood is speaking for you now. See, it's because the blood is sprinkled. That's why you can ask God for forgiveness in the first place. Who told you you, you can be forgiven? There's no forgiveness in anybody. Forgiveness is only in Jesus. It's in Jesus that you and I have forgiveness. And it's because the blood is being sprinkled. That's why you have forgiveness. When you go to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry, you think it's your kneeling down that will pay for your immorality. Do you know what happened when you fornicated? Do you know the princes in darkness that you gave access to? You don't even understand what, what happens organically for sins to be forgiven. For sins to be forgiven, the Son of God had to die. He had to be put to shame. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was not wearing boxers. He was naked. That is God humiliated among men. So you think because you came and cried, oh, Lord, have mercy. Ah, ah, you are forgiven. You are a funny man. When we go to ask for forgiveness, we are doing that with assurance that the blood is speaking. The blood is the basis for your asking for forgiveness. And that's why in this kingdom, the Bible says there is nothing you can boast about. Everything you are, will ever be, and can ever be, is based on what Jesus did. There's no room for boasting. The man who is standing is not standing because he's strong. He's standing because the Holy Ghost is at work in him. The blood is what cleanses you from sin. If you are righteous, it's because the blood is speaking. Not just because you have the nature of God. The blood is constantly being furnished in your direction. What the Bible calls forgiveness is not pardon. God doesn't know how to pardon. You can insult me. And I say, okay, don't worry. I pardoned you. God doesn't know how to do that. God doesn't pardon. <laughs> I know some people are hearing it for the first time. Spirits don't pardon. If the offense is there, you must be punished. Because spirits are just. They are just beings. And they walk in the realm of the spirit, which is a legal system. There is nothing like pardon. The word used for as forgiveness in the New Testament is the word aphesis. In the Greek, it means to be blotted out. The reason God forgave you is because your sins were washed. So even God Himself, when He checks, He won't see it. If God sees your sin, you'll be punished. If God looks at you and He sees your sin, you'll be punished. The reason God forgives you is because when He checks you and scrutinizes you, He can't see your sin the blood will wash it off. That's why he said your sins were blotted out. If there's no economy of the blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. 
The Bible says, without the blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. If your sins are not washed us, God, God can pardon you. So the reason we ask for forgiveness in the first place is because the blood is speaking. The thing was washed off. And there is a technology in God that is so strange. You know, God dwells in eternity. Eternity means, it doesn't really mean beyond time. It means outside of time. So God can still enter your yesterday and be relating with you as if yesterday is today. He can enter into your future now that you are here. And God will interact with you in the future and go back to heaven. When you, you arrive at the future, then you start talking to God. You say, I have an encounter. No, that encounter was there since the foundation of the world. <laughs> it's the dynamics of spirit life. See, the encounter you will have tomorrow is already in tomorrow. Because God doesn't work by time. And the same way, when God forgives you your sins, He entered your yesterday and deleted it. He entered your day before yesterday and deleted it. So you yourself, if you go back to yesterday, you will not find your sin. It's not there. It's the technology of the blood. He blots out your sins. That's why God can forgive you. Because the sin is no longer there. And that is why every time we look at Jesus, we say thank you. There is nothing we can tell him but thank you. Because we did nothing. We don't deserve it. It's mercy. want to be where you are. Your presence. That's why the presence of God is the only place to be. That's the only place to be and have meaning. To be near to where you are. I just want to be where you are. Dwell in place forever. Take me through the place where you are. I just want to be with you. See, if you understand the gospel right, you become very, very reasonable, and you become very, very grateful. Do you know why sometimes we are arrogant around God? We don't have understanding of what He did for us. The same way the blood spoke for your sins yesterday and day before yesterday, the blood is already speaking about your sins in the future. So when you enter the future, you enter with gratitude. You say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So you knew I will mess up and you are still using me. Do you know as we are moving in the anointing now, we may sin tomorrow. God knows that we will see tomorrow. There are some prophets that minister powerfully in the anointing. One month later, two months later, they fell into fornication. When they were moving the anointing, God was already aware they would fall into fornication. How did God still allow them to move in power? It's the mystery of the blood. Because the blood is already there. That time you are asking for forgiveness, the blood is already there. That's why we are so grateful. When people begin to grow in God, right? When you come to look, hear their prayers, they don't have many things to say. Sometimes a man kneels down for four hours and he says, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Sometimes he lays down and he says, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. Why can you use a man like me? Have mercy. That man has grown. But when you see a young believer, he will stand and say, him that dwells in the right hand of Zion. Him that moved by the powers of the consolation. He that has his talking grammar, he thinks his grammar. But the elders, they have seen the sacrifice. They understand the weight of the sacrifice. So when they show up, they say, have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. The blood is the last card. <laughs> you are justified because of the blood. Never allow the devil come to put you in bondage anymore. The reason you will not sin is not because you now discover you are forgiven, so you do what you want. The reason you will not sin is because the love of God constrains you. Now you have known the love of God. The love of God constrains you. Listen, some preachers come and say, if you tell people this kind of thing, they will continue in sin. It's a lie. They gave them over 600 laws in the Old Testament. 
They were even killing some. They were stoning people to death. People were still sinning. Fear does not stop you from sinning. Fear will only torment you. The Bible says fear brings a torment. What will set you free from sin is the love of God. Paul said the love of God constrains us. It constrains us. Because we understand. We understand. We understand that there was one that has borne our sins. The reason most Christians are not grateful is because they don't understand the depth of the work of Jesus. If a man shows you mercy, you can never offend him. Even in the natural, you understand better. You don't have school fees. They were driving you from school and somebody pays your school fees forever. You'll be tempted. It's called the love of God. And it's the mystery of the blood. That's what silences Satan. If Satan knows that you understand that the blood is speaking for you, he will not come troubling you with depression anymore. I don't know what will happen to me to be depressed. I can never be depressed. I can never. And I'm telling you, I've seen terrible things. I have seen terrible things. I can never be depressed. I was in 300 level in 2009 when my mom died. I woke up in the morning. They told me my heart broke apart. But I got up. I said, thank you, Lord. You know better. This is not what I desire. But I know at the end, you have a better answer. And I went and wrote my exam that day. Some years ago, my other brother died. I had an impartation service the next day. I went to the impartation service. I was crying, but I was ministering. The power of God. I can't be depressed. I was serving in worry in 2013. The day I entered that book, I was in Kano first, but I had to go to worry. So many stories. The day I entered, I was going to worry in Agbo. Armed robbers robbed people just before our car came. Oh, and I was like, I've entered the jungle. I entered that day to get my place of primary assignment. And while I moved around, I didn't get a place that day. I had to return to Asaba. I checked my pocket. There was 20 naira. I had exhausted all my money. Wow. I began to speak in tongues. I carried my phone to call my friend. Battery, bong, 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 battery, phone went off. And I just saw a robbery. And I don't have any place to stay in worry. I began to speak in tongues and headed towards the ATM. God, you will either answer today or me and you will die. Takapa sotaya, retatash, bariata, etataya. If what they say about speaking in tongues is true, it will prove itself today. Because if this tongue cannot deliver me, I will not speak it when I see a demon. Shatata, barakata. I entered the ATM. I slaughtered my, my ATM and I withdrew 5,000. Meanwhile, there was no cobo there. Shatata, elakatea. Oh, if you don't learn these things, you will try to understand it in the day of trouble, but that day there will be anxiety. That's why it's better to learn it when you are at peace. The day trouble comes, you are already a master. You are not going to entire and error. You are a master. Many people pray in tongues when their wives are in the labor room. No, no, no. You had nine months of prayer. <laughs> When things don't happen, they don't come and say, Oh God, why? Oh God, why? You are a foolish man. The Bible said that labor of the foolish wearied every one of them because they know not how to enter the city. There is a technology of apprehending things in God. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 15. And it doesn't stop there. In verse 16 and 17, he said, Woe unto the land whose king is a child and whose prince is eat for pleasure. He said, but blessed is the land whose king is the son of the noble and whose princes eat for strength and not for drunkenness. When you come into understanding, you take responsibilities. We don't live our life by chance. We take responsibility. When I knew that scripture, I don't eat breakfast. I, I pray in tongues and I, I say no. Even if it's even if I'm wrong, I will apply this one literally. You take responsibility for your life and for everybody around you. Woe, woe unto the land 
whose king is a child. Many people are babes. That's why the devil torments them. You eat these things, you internalize them, you persuade yourself, you are convinced by it. The day trouble comes, you will stand and say, hey, what are you doing? Bishop Oedepo was in the hotel and thieves came robbing. And then he came down with his nightgown. And they said, hey, come on, what are you doing there? And the people that had gone began to run. Say, hey, fire, fire. <laughs> That's the extent to which he understands it. That's the extent to which he understands it. They asked John Trillick, how can you carry viruses in your hand that you are not affected? He said, my soul is exercised in eternal life. You trade with these things every day. They look very simple, but they are your insurance in life. You eat it every day, you hear it every day, you study it every day until without thinking it becomes a natural flow. People want to hear about patterns, about dimensions, about the angelic realm. But they don't apply that any day of their life. The basic things they apply, they don't want to hear it. It's too simple for them. That's why many are in trouble. Did you not notice these places where they teach redemptive reality that they see the greatest miracles? All the places where they talk about spiritual ranking and patterns and pathways. In a conference of seven days, only one death here will be open. But the guy who is talking about the love of God, the mercy of God, if he begins to move, people are standing up in their numbers. These are the things that make the difference in life. Hallelujah. <laughs> the mystery of the blood is an insurance policy of heaven. And thirdly, it's called the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is higher than all the names. Alpha and Omega. There is no other name like him. The name of Jesus is higher than all the names. King of all peace. No other name like him. The name of Jesus is higher than all the names. Alpha and Omega. No other name like him. King of all peace, no other name like that name. That song will be our activator of the miracle power. Wait, small. The window has not opened. The name of Jesus. Many people don't understand what the name of Jesus is, so they are in a vehicle, and then the driver just breaks with full force. Jesus, 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 Jesus. They just profess their fear. They are calling Jesus, but what went up in the spirit realm is fear. And it's a dark cloud. You know, the economy of language in the spirit is different from the natural. Even your thoughts make statements in the spirit realm. What left you is fear. And the demons will know that, oh, this guy is afraid. Thank God. <laughs> they know what to do. If you know the name of Jesus, you are a conqueror in life. You know, I'm trying to watch my time. You know, today, today, I'm not talking about transformations. I'm keeping it calm so that you will know it's God that does these things. It's not the man. Most times when I share the gospel, I try to make people look away from the man to look at Jesus. You know, nowadays, there are many ways men of God package themselves. The guy enters the hall and is quiet. He just sits like this. He's connected to heaven. That time, his, his angels are talking to him. We never come close to him. It doesn't relate with anybody in close proximity. Even if you are in the same house, you can't talk to man of God. But Jesus was cropping into the bush with his disciples, yet miracles were happening. There's a place for discipline. There's a place for order. But it should not become a show. It should not become a thing of pride. Because most of you here who are young ministers, 
Very soon you will begin to preach. Let it not enter your head that you are something. If not, you will turn people from Jesus to you. So you go for meetings. People are running to touch the shoe of the man to talk. But the Holy Ghost has been crying every morning for them to come into his presence. They don't come. But the man of God show up. They, are, they, are, they want to touch the button of his shirt. If you will clamor around the Holy Ghost like that for two weeks, your life will change. If you will hunger to touch Jesus like that for one week, you will be a changed man. And we don't learn. You do that with all the big men of God you knew, your life is still where it is. And we don't learn. When you read the Bible, try to follow it carefully. People live with Apostle Paul. And Paul was telling them to pray in tongues and fan to flame what they have received. Now, if you have a vision with, of Paul, you will say you are, you, are, you are a Colossus. You say, it's Paul that appeared to me. Paul, Paul. Meanwhile, the Timothy that live with Paul every day, he say, make sure you fan to flame the gift of God and the city. He pointed Timothy to the precepts and the principles of the kingdom. Because he was not the thing happening. Jesus is the reigning king. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is the seal of authority in the spirit realm. In the spirit realm, names are not primarily for nomenclature. Names are signatures of authority. If you read the Old Testament, every time God demonstrated a feat of his power, that encounter is trapped in the name. Because names are carriers of the full essence of a spirit reality. When God showed up and met the needs of Adam, he called him the El Shaddai. So that his generations after him, if they can invoke the name of the El Shaddai, the same encounter that he had, they too will walk in it. That was why Abraham walked with the El Shaddai. Isaac walked with the El Shaddai. Jacob walked with the El Shaddai. Because the fullness of the reality of God as El Shaddai is trapped in the name. When you can apprehend the name of a spirit, you have the full authority of that spirit. They are encapsulators of the essence of spirit beings. That's why the children of Israel called God names. They wanted to trap and immortalize their encounters. So anyone that shows up after 50 years, if things go wrong, he will call upon the name of that God and the dimensions of that God will manifest when we call the name of Jesus the name of Jesus is the fullness of all of the totality of the Godhead put together the Bible said in Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, they said it pleased the Father that the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in him bodily, so when you invoke the name of Jesus you are invoking the powers of the Godhead with the name of Jesus you don't need to call El Shaddai you don't need to call El Elyon, you don't need to call Jehovah Sabaoth when you call Jesus, the fullness of God comes to manifestation. It is the seal of authority that we have in the heavens. That name was not available among men. Men had no authority to use that name. For men to use that name, Jesus had to become a man and pay the demands of justice of the Father before that name was available for men. In Philippians 2, verse 5 to 9, after Jesus did all that he did, the Bible said, and God exalted him and gave him a name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, both in heaven, on earth, and in the world beneath. And every tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord. So what God added to the name of Jesus for man to use is the Lord. So every time you invoke the name of Jesus, you become Lord over circumstances. When he was born, his name was called Jesus. But Lord was not part of Jesus when he was born. Lord became part of Jesus when the sacrifice was complete. So if you call the name of Jesus, you become Lord over principalities and powers. You become Lord over demons. You become Lord over sicknesses and diseases. It is the greatest seal of authority that we have on earth. So anytime you call that name, never call it in fear. Because the name of Jesus is significant of lordship. Lordship. 
when you say Jesus, what you are doing is that you are proclaiming yourself to be above the circumstance. That's why when we see the sick, we say Jesus. When we see the demon possessed, we say Jesus. Because in Jesus, we proclaim Lordship. And it was available to you on the strength of the sacrifice. These are insurance policies that God put in place for your victory in life. Doesn't this God care so much? God knew you were going to sin sometimes tomorrow, so he put the blood. God knew you were going to be condemned in eternity, so he put the cross. God knew you were going to have crises and challenges, so he put the name. What a loving father. If you understand the love of God, your life will change. Higher than all the name, Alpha and Omega, no other name like him. The name of Jesus is higher than all the name. King of all kings, no other name like him. The last thing I want to share with us this evening is called the mercy of God. You see, these other things I have revealed, you need to know them and walk in them for them to work for you. But when we talk about the economy of mercy, it's when God go out of his way to reach out to you. You know, salvation, there was no covenant upon which salvation could be prosecuted. The reason God stepped out to provide grace and love was because of mercy. Mercy is what makes God to go out of his way to reach you. The covenants that you invoke and are put in place, they were there because God had mercy for you. The Bible said, as a father pitieth his son. As a father pitieth his son. That is what God sees towards you. So the times when you didn't know the revelation of the name of Jesus to invoke it, there was something working called mercy. The time when you didn't know about the love of God, there was something working is called mercy. In Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22, the Bible said, for his mercy we are not consumed. Many times we don't know the resources to use But there is something at work The reason you went for that interview and you passed Favor spoke for you even though you didn't prepare for it Was because there is an economy called mercy The mercy of God is superior to covenant Because covenants are born because of mercy Mercy is the platform that covenant rests upon If you know God is merciful towards you Every day of your life you will be confident And every day of your life you will be full of gratitude because even the places where we lack understanding. You know, the Bible said my people perish for the lack of knowledge. Have you noticed there are many areas where you lack understanding, yet you are still alive? It is the mercy of God that speaks. It's the mercy of God. These are insurance policies. I don't have time anymore to expo- expound on things. That's why I'm speeding up. But we are going to pray for the sick now. We are going to pray for the sick now. Can you lift your hands toward heaven and worship God? The name of Jesus, higher than all the names, Alpha and Omega, no other name like you. Hey, 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 hey. And exalt his name. Give him praise for what he will do tonight. The name of Jesus. Worship him tonight. Exalt his name. Give him praise. No other name like you. Kidney infection.
infections, liver infections, hepatitis, kidney stone, every kind of organ infection, heart infections, lung infections. Right now, you devil of darkness, I charge you out of them. Every bone infection, dislocations, bone disorders, hear the word of the Lord. I charge you, lose your grip over them in the name of Jesus. Every irregular growth in your body, lumps in the breast, growth in the armpit, growth on every part of the body that is irregular in the name of Jesus, I command you, dissolve. Let every form of chain, mental chains that cause retardation in understanding, that cause lukewarmness, backwardness, depression, you devil, what are you waiting for? Out in the name of Jesus. Come on. We are going to dance now. And as we begin to dance, you will discover something strange has happened. People with ear issues will discover it's opening. Growth will be vanishing. Eye infections. You are using glasses. Remove it and check. You will be amazed. Where is the lead? Where is the lead? Hallelujah. Hey. Hey. Hallelujah. Oh. Hey. Hallelujah. Oh. It's a sound of victory. Sound of victory. Hallelujah. Hey. Hallelujah. Hey. Hallelujah. Oh. Shame on Satan. You have somebody, a relative who is sick. You have the picture lifted now. You can call the person, call now. We are about to send the healing power of God to your houses. Everybody connected to a sick person here. Everybody connected to a sick person. I come by the rod of a higher priesthood and I command the sickness. Bow to the name of Jesus. Bow to the name of Jesus. Ossas. Cancers, bone infection, liver infection, kidney infection, lung infection, blinding devils, deafening spirits. I command you, bow to the name of Jesus. Bow to the name of Jesus. Let there be healing right now. Everybody you are connected to right now, the power of God goes. The power of God goes to heal and to deliver. Right now. Right now. Right now. In the name of Jesus. Go ahead and call your relatives and find out. Come on, give me some. Hallelujah, eh. Hallelujah, oh. Eh. Hallelujah, eh. It's the sound of victory. Eh. Hallelujah, eh. Hallelujah, oh. Let the sound of rejoicing fill this. Hallelujah, eh, hallelujah, eh, hallelujah, oh, hallelujah, oh, hallelujah, eh, hallelujah, eh, in the sound of victory, hallelujah, eh, hallelujah, eh, hallelujah, oh, hallelujah, oh, that's the sound. have time. In the next two minutes as we sing, you've checked your body, something has happened, pain has departed, you can see where something has happened, just come to the front very quickly. We'll take those two testimonies and then we'll flow because we have other activities. Let the sound sing, let the sound of rejoicing Hey, he has made a way, he has made a way, where there is no way. Hallelujah, hey, hey, it's the sound of healing. Hallelujah, hey, hallelujah, hey, hallelujah, hey, let the sound. Hallelujah, hey. Hallelujah, hey. It's the 
Discover you are healed. Come to the front now. Let's take testimony and give all the glory to Jesus. He's the healer tonight. Come on. of infirmity. A demon of infirmity. Come on, give the Lord a big shout of praise. What happened? What happened? Give her the mic. Wait, wait. She says she's not done yet. Can we hear you please? I want to thank God for my life because I have an abnormal growth at my chest. Like the middle of my chest. Like there is this pain. It comes it was not there before, but all of a sudden it comes. I will pray it will go. I will use another thing it will go. Later it will come again. I'm like, God, what, is what has Jesus done now? Can I pray that God, if truly you are God, if truly, truly you know you are God, this thing must go. It must go. Ah, and I thank God it has gone. I don't feel it here anymore. Hey, and I know it has gone. She had a pain in the chest caused by an abnormal growth. The pain is gone. The pain is gone. 
If he likes, let him frustrate the sound. We are having a ride in glory. What happened, sister? I don't even know how to thank God, but I just want to thank him. My father has been diabetic for six years. Her father has been diabetic for six years. What happened, sister? His blood sugar has been regulated since yesterday. There has no issue. Since yesterday. The blood sugar has restored to normal. Kabiosi. 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 We call that digital miracle. Are you done or you have another one? She's trying to catch her breath. Come on, somebody say, Jesus, we are juggling. We are juggling. We have not started running. We are just juggling. Tell us, sister, what happened? He also has issues with high BP. I didn't hear that. He has issues with high blood pressure. He also has issues with high BP. So when he said there will be a healing service, I called him. When I was coming, you called him because we said it was a healing service. When I, was I coming, told you about the law of expectation. What happened? So I had enough. I mostly reached because of this service, and I kept him on call throughout the service. And when he said we should call, I called and they checked his blood. His high blood Wait, pressure. you just went out now and called. They checked his blood pressure immediately, and it was normal for the first time in two years. <laughs> Listen, she just went out now and called her father and high BP went down for the first time in two years. Who did this? Glory! Are you done? What happened, sister? Um, um, from yesterday, I was having a race pain, and he came, he kept on going and coming. So today, when he said we should, um, you were talking about praying about our pains and dislocations, I first felt like there's nothing wrong with me, it's just normal. So the pain came again, and I prayed about it. And when he told us to dance, I tried to check in and check in. And, and the worst pain was no longer is gone. Pain. The worst pain is what? It's gone. Give me a song now. Why are you not inspiring? Listen, listen, listen. Let me show you. Let me teach you a secret. The Bible said the testimony of the righteous is just making wise the simple. When one is giving testimony, what happens is that the faith of another is growing. And while the testimony is going, you can be receiving your own. So don't just shout. Come on. Tell Jesus, give me my own now. <laughs> ta, 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 ta. What happened, sister? I've been sick for two and a half weeks. First time they said it was poisoning. Later I went for a checkup. They said it's infection. But they did not tell me what type of infection. I they said it was food poisoning. Later they now said infection. infection. So what happened? So I've been taking antibiotics. Yeah, it was not working. I could not even stand like this. You couldn't stand like this. For two and a half weeks. Two and a half weeks. Who did this? For two weeks, they said food poisoning. 
They said infection. She has been taking antibiotics. It wasn't working. But all of a sudden, something happened. Strength came and the pain left. And she could stand. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. What happened, sister? All to bless the name of the Lord concerning my health. Um, I've had this issue for like a year plus. Whenever I'm stressed out, I have sores all over my mouth. I've gone through a series of investigations and all of that. It proved nothing. I've taken a series of medications. For how long now? A year plus. For one year plus, sores on the mouth. Yes, and I can't even, to the extent of going for a trivia test, everything was negative. Doctor could not tell me what was wrong. With me. So what I can't, happened? I can't smile. I can't laugh when it comes. You couldn't laugh or smile. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Listen, you didn't hear her testimony. Sauce on the mouth that was so severe she couldn't smile. But all of a sudden, everything is gone. She can't just smile. She's hey. shouting. Come on. Anurue God. And the Lord God. The all sufficient God. Anurue God. Anurue God. Anurue God. The all sufficient Anurue God. Hey. What happened, sister? Hallelujah. Praise Master Jesus. From on Sunday morning, I was feeling pain at this side of my stomach. Pain on the left, right side of your stomach. Yeah, so I was From so, Sunday morning. Yes, I was so scared. I was like, let's not be appendix because my mom just did appendix operation. My elder sister did appendix operation. My nephew did appendix operation. So Satan has so, been plaguing your family with I appendix. I was so scared. But Pastor Vichy told me yesterday that I should just give him to the came to the prophets of the man of God that I should just have faith and my healing is going to come. I could not go sleep so, for some nights, but I thank God that today I can jump, I can scream. Did you hear what she just said? Her mom, listen, listen, her mom appendicitis, her sister appendicitis, and who else? Nephew appendicitis. The same pain came, she couldn't sleep, but something just happened. The pain is gone. Somebody say, Jesus the healer. Jesus the healer. What happened, brother? Praise God. There is this childhood problem I've been having. Childhood problem? Yes. How old are you now? Um, I'm 19 years old. You are 19 years old. And you had the problem from childhood. from childhood. What's the problem? The problem was a naval problem. Naval yes. problem. Yes. Help us. That it happened to me to the extent that sometimes I can't even use my mouth because it was trying to turn into an imbecile something then to the extent that I started growing because of that it always affected my mouth you started growing what? I started, it started affecting my mouth Okay. That it started uh, tearing my mouth that sometimes I would start having big wounds inside my mouth and then what did he, God do now? what did God do? he saved me after money has been wasted in it because I went to a Memphis hospital and they said it was that something about my brain that brain trying to shut down. Your brain trying to shut down. Yes. This doctor sometimes is like demons used to inspire them. How can you tell somebody your brain is trying to shut down? I used to have big injuries in your mouth. You used to have big injuries in your mouth. So what happened? What happened? Now I can believe that today I can still stand on my own because it's no longer affecting me on the normal. Everything is gone. Everything is gone. Hear what Jesus just told him this evening. He said, You are healed. You are healed, brother. You are healed, brother. And he can use his mouth. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. Let's take this last one. Let's take this last one. We must take your own. Come this way, come this way. The mic, the speaker is interrupting us. Quick, quick, quick. Let's hear your testimony. What did God do for you, brother? Um, first of all, I'd like to thank God for my life. First yeah, of all, thanking God with you. What did God do now? Um, 
my mother, I, I would like to thank God for my family as well. But most especially, we thank God especially, for your family. What did Jesus do now? Nah. Most especially, my mom has been having this um, hand pain. You your know? mom has been having hand pain? Yes. But before I came here, she gave me a phone call and said, everything is over. Hey! What happened? What happened? Okay, for some for some weeks now, for some weeks now, I've been having pain because of stress. I know it was as a result of stress, but when I wake up in the morning and I go about my normal activities, everything will be fine. But it was not leading to sickness. But when I wake up, I consider my normal activities it will be fine. I'll go back to sleep. I'll feel the pain. Last week, entering this week, became worse. But it was just normal then. I came to church this evening, still feeling pains all over my back, my shoulder. But while worshipping and praying, and as we were praying, I just felt this body just lifted. And right now, I feel no pain anymore. Listen, listen. The healing anointing is about to rest on somebody's hand. Don't try to, don't try to make it happen. Just lift your hands toward heaven. Let's have it calm now. Jesus wants to equip people now. So that many healers will be living on this campus. It will not be testimonies you have after programs. Just whisper to the Lord that I'm ready. And we answer the distress call. Even if they have to call me by night, I'll be there. I will be available. Jesus looks for available verses. Tell him now. Tell him now. Tell him now.
from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet. Ushers, you just help them, but let's keep it calm. From the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet. Holy Ghost, prove on them now. Anoint them, anoint them, anoint them. Men walking with the healing power, fighting and shutting down installations of darkness, ending the plague and the reign of Satan in the borders of their habitation. Men that will stand as witnesses, anoint now. Let the oil of healing rest on their hands tangibly. The oil, the oil, the healing mantle, the healing anointing, the faith for healing, the spirit of healing. Receive now. Receive now. You are Jesus Christ. Israel, we are the candidates now. Power. We are the ones who are marked. Touch. Touch. We are the people who are marked. Touch. Touch. Jesus. They are the healers. The ones who have asked to be used as vessels. Consciously exercise your faith every day. You hear somebody sick, don't look for the pastor, pray for the person. Begin to exercise your faith every day. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. 
and also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also, if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.